have no right to infringe the basic human rights of everyone, even the criminal, with the infliction of torture. So, if you say God has said we should amputate the hand of the thief, that is a clear example of how certain uh, commands in Islam are against human rights and therefore not compatible with modern human rights thinking. And I stand in front of everyone today with full confidence that this claim will not be refuted. Liberalism can and has and is capable of producing death penalty outcomes for non-allegiance to the state, for example. Hudud, the laws, barbaric, outdated, dysfunctional laws, which is a genetic fallacy, by the way. And you should know as a philosopher that presenting cases like this is weak. Then he mentioned democracy, which is even, it's even older than Prophet Muhammad. So it's even more outdated, so it should be even more wrong in your understanding. But then, here's what I'm saying to you. The point is this. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greet greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon all of you. I am Fahad Qureshi, the chair for this debate today, this very interesting debate about Islam. Does Islam need to be liberalized or not? And we are talking specifically about traditional Islam, orthodox Islam. And by liberalized, we mean, do we need to renew Islam? Is Islam suitable for the 21st century? Is Islam suitable for the West and the values that we are living within in the West? That's the main topic of discussion today. Why is this topic so important? The reason why it is so important is that politics are based upon this. We see different political suggestions coming all the time, wanting to change Islam or restrict Islamic practices based upon the notion that Islam is not suitable or traditional Islam is not suitable for the modern Western society. So Islam needs to be liberated. It needs to be uh, progressed in terms of being able to fit in the modern context. So that's going to be our debate today. And the organization organizing this debate is, as you know, Islamnet, and Islamnet is a Norwegian da'wah organization focusing upon giving da'wah, meaning spreading information about Islam in the Western society with a special focus on Norway. And we also, we also have a big focus on inspiring young Muslims to find their Muslim identity and feel confident about their religion. So inspire young Muslims to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of our main projects nowadays is that we are raising funds to establish a Norwegian da'wah center and a masjid. A masjid and a da'wah center that we hope that would help the, Nor the Muslim Norwegian youth reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as we see the masses of young Muslims, they may not be practicing Islam. They may not be very interested in Islam. But if we reconnect their faith with Allah, then we believe that that would be bringing them success in this world and in the hereafter. So if you want to know more about this project, we've named this project Save Iman. So you could go to the website saveiman.com and read more about it. Saveiman.com. And for those watching online, we will have the link in the description to read about that project for you to be able to support that project as well. This is Iman. She's 14 years old, a Norwegian Muslim living with her parents. In the next 20 seconds, she is going to send indecent pictures of herself to her secret boyfriend. This is why.
Norway, a Scandinavian country that Muslims migrated to 50 years ago, with around 200,000 Muslims. But this is changing. Muslim names are increasing, but Iman is dying in the hearts of our youth. The vast majority of these Muslims do not pray and are leaving their Islamic heritage and adopting the Western lifestyle. Why is this happening? Why are the youth leaving the Islamic way of life? The majority of Muslims came to Norway seeking financial opportunities. The mosques that were established were centered around culture from back home, and the next generation of Muslims assimilated to the Western lifestyle. The main source of Islamic knowledge remained the Friday sermon that was conducted in the mother tongue of the first generation of Muslims, so the youth didn't connect to it. Iman is not happy at home. Her parents often tell her to start praying and stay away from boys, and that makes Iman feel suffocated and depressed, because no one taught her why Islam teaches Muslims to pray, or why it sets moral boundaries for relationships with the opposite gender. Iman doesn't know what to do. On one side, she loves her family and she loves Allah. On the other side, she doesn't understand Islam and its restrictions and guidelines don't make sense to her. So she is living a double life, Muslim at home and someone else outside. Iman is not just an individual. She symbolizes the Iman of the majority of young Norwegian Muslims. They are struggling to retain their Islamic identity and are drifting away from Islam. We need to save Iman. We need to start at the grassroots level. The problem lies in the lack of Islamic knowledge, resulting in the weakening of Iman. So we want to build the country's first Islamic Dawah Center, combined with a masjid that will share the message of Islam in a way that the youth of today can relate to. It will have a youth center where the youth can come instead of hanging in the streets or going to Western clubs. It will have Islamic programs and activities where the youth can learn their religion. It will have a studio for mass production of dawah material for social media. It will educate the Muslim community on how to bring up their children on Islamic values. We have already raised about $1 million locally, and to make this project come true, we need to raise the remaining amount. There are 1.8 billion Muslims, but the question is, are you one of those very special people who will help save Iman? Please, click the link, give for the sake of Allah, and earn your reward. Also, we need to make the Muslim world aware of this campaign, so please do whatever you can. Share this video on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all other social media networks. We alone cannot save Iman, but together, we can. So back to the debate. Our two very respectable candidates for the debate today are Dr. Lars Gula and Mohammed Hijab. So to begin with, let me introduce Dr. Lars Gula, who will be the first person to speak today. Dr. Lars Gula is a philosopher. He has graduated with a doctorate in philosophy and is an associate professor at Oslo Metropolitan University. From 2000 to the year of 2005, he was secretary general of the Norwegian Humanist Association. Gula became famous or known to the general public in 1977 when after having joined the DFLP group, Gula was arrested in Beirut, Lebanon with explosives in his luggage intended for Israeli targets, leading to a six-month conviction and subsequent deportation. He remains a pro-Palestinian uh, a pro-Palestinian and in regards to his stance on Islam and Muslims, my personal opinion is that he is very balanced, he is very nuanced. He is not the kind of person who would spread fabrications about Islam and Muslims. He is not the kind of person who would spread Islamophobic theories. In fact, he is one of the most outspoken individuals in a Norwegian context against uh, right-wing extremists and people who spread 
uh, conspiracy theories about Islam and Muslims. So we have great respect for Dr. Lars Güler, in spite of disagreeing with him in some, uh, some points. And he is a critic of Islam. And on my, on my left hand side is uh, Muhammad Hijab. He is a famous debater and YouTuber. He is well known from his uh, debates from Hyde Park at Speaker's Corner, where he debates many different people and he travels around the world and engages in dialogue, in debates with academics. So Muhammad Hijab is very well known in the, in the Muslim world and he completed a degree in politics and a master's in history from Queen Mary University. He completed another master's degree in Islamic studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies. He has taught and instructed courses on humanities and languages in many contexts. He has numerous ijazas in some Islamic sciences and has studied in multiple Islamic seminaries, including the Shinqiti Institute, which employs a traditional Mauritanian style of teaching the sacred sciences. Muhammad is currently doing further postgraduate studies in applied theology. So that's our two respective speakers for tonight's debate. And the setup will be that each speaker will have uh, 20 minutes to make his case, to make an introduction to his case. So we will start with Dr. Lars Gula giving his presentation and then Muhammad Hijab will give his presentation in 20 minutes each. After that, we will have 10 minutes each of a rebuttal session where Dr. Lars will be responding to what Muhammad Hijab has said and vice versa. After that, we will have a cross examination where each of the speakers would have the opportunity to uh, cross examine, to ask questions to the other speaker. And that speaker would have three minutes each to answer those specific questions. After that, we will have our, we will open the floor for the audience. So the audience could also participate and ask their questions to each respective speaker. And we will conclude with each speaker having five minutes to give their final statements. So without any further ado, I would request Dr. Lars to take, come to the microphone and begin his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> and I believe it is fruitful to have serious discussions, thank you, about these important questions. And the question posed today is, does traditional Islam need to be liberalized? The answer is yes. And I could actually stop here and give the remainder of my time to my honorable opponent, because he will need more than the allotted, his allotted 20 minutes to explain why his outdated and dysfunctional religious tradition does not need liberalization in the 21st century. However, for this to become a meaningful debate, I will give some of the reasons for my short answer. But first of all, there are internal resources in the Islamic tradition in traditional Islam that can be utilized and that has been utilized in the past to develop interpretations that take Islam in a liberalizing direction, especially the interpretive principles of ijtihad supplemented with the principle of the common good maslaha. Furthermore, my short answer, of course, has to do with how we understand the term and the concept traditional Islam. What is it? What is this object that I and many with me, including numerous Muslims, think thinks are in need of liberalization? We also need to clarify what is meant by liberalization. Is it the same as reform or reformation? It seems that what 
<clears throat> it seems that Islamnet organizing this event have made this interpretation the most relevant for this debate, but I'm not sure that it is. But my honorable opponent's views on Islam and traditional Islam are not the only views. He and his followers attempts at monopolizing their interpretation as the correct interpretation or mainstream interpretation of Islam flies in the face of the fact that their position, the position of Islamnet and the followers of Islamnet here today is a minority position within the Islamic world today. It's not the majority. It is not what Muslims, nor not even the majority of scholars think is the right interpretation. So, before I give my reasons for why reform of Islam should entail liberalization, I will say something about this, what is Islam and so-called traditional Islam. Part of the problem is that it is almost impossible to give an all comprehensive definition of Islam. It is a religion. In that sense, it is what Muslims believe within some parameters. One cannot say I'm a Muslim and be believe anything. There are certain limits, but those limits are fairly wide. Islam is even more. It can be said to be a culture and also a 14 centuries old civilization. And these three forms, Islam as a religion, Islam as a culture, and Islam as a civilization, or these three ways of understanding Islam will overlap and they influence each other. Here we are concerned with Islam as a religion. And a religion can be said to consist of the following factors or elements. A cosmogony, that is a narrative of creation, a, stor a story about how everything came to be. A cosmology, an understanding of how the world is working. An epistemology, an explanation on, of how we know what we know an ethic, rules for a good life, and finally, cultic practices. The short Islamic answers to these points are, on the cosmogony, God, Allah, created the world out of nothing. Cosmology, God has organized the world and is the cause of everything that happens. And perhaps in certain interpretations, and we see, how variation in the interpretation enters very quickly into the picture. Some think that perhaps science can help us understand how God had organized the universe, the universe i.e. everything. Epistemology, a theory of knowledge, saying that we have knowledge through revelation. Perhaps science can help us understand, but revelation is the most important source of knowledge. Ethics, the rules for a good life are the same as the will of God for mankind, or the revealed law of God, Sharia. And Sharia covers all aspects, all aspects of man's life, especially, or actually not only uh, between all men, the Mu'amalat, but it also covers, when we come to cultic practices, man's relation to God, ibadat, which is also part of the overall legal ethical perspective of uh, uh, Islam. So, of course, there has been differences in the understanding of these building blocks of Islam throughout Islam's history. Some have said that the world is not created, but eternal, coextensive with God. Others say that man has free will, and therefore man can cause both good and evil. There are those who have said that the revelation is, as found in the Quran and Sunnah, cannot be understood literally. We need to understand the metaphoric language of the Quran, and even the hidden meaning of the Quran, and interpret it in a rational way. Others say we should take the word literally 
and not try to understand the metaphors of the Quran as God is sitting, but he is totally different from human beings. How can he sit? Bila kaifa. Others say that we should take the word literally and not try to understand, while Sufis say we should attempt union with God. And they have various meditative techniques developed for the purpose. And perhaps the Sufi traditions, the Sufi tariqas, are the largest organizations of Muslims in the Muslim world. Many Muslims mix traditional values and Islam and still believe they are good Muslims, i.e. they are following the will of God. Some find ethical guidelines in what they believe is the will of God as revealed in the Quran and the example of their prophet. But the will of God, even if seen by many Muslim scholars as com a complete and total system, needs interpretation based on Quran, Sunnah, Ijtihad and Ijma. However, there is no unanimity on how to interpret. Accordingly, there are many interpretations with major and major, ma major differences. In Sunni Islam, there are four surviving schools of law, Madahib, but there have been other attempts at understanding the will of God. Those schools or those attempts did not survive the test of time. And we have numerous other differences in metaphysical approaches, in theological approaches, etc. There are differences that vary over time, and there are differences from place to place within the Muslim world in the past and today. In short, there are numerous versions of Islam, even within Sunni Islam, and in addition we have various Shia interpretations. Do they all have something in common, apart from the five pillars? Difficult to say. As an outsider, as a researcher, it is not my job to decide which interpretation is the correct one. That's for Muslims to quarrel about. You're welcome. And I do. Mr. Hijab has no serious claim to represent the, two, the true interpretation. As a researcher, I observe that there are certain agreements on the level of scholars and also certain elements practical, uh, practical Islam, so to speak. Common practices across various interpretations and cultures. Some of these interpretations and practices do need to change. For example, the discrimination of knowledge, discarding scientific knowledge that goes against revelation, discriminating internally within Islam against those you disagree with. Like, for example, the Shia, Ahmadiyya, but also within Sunni Islam, the Ma'atasila, not respected, not accepted as part of traditional Islam today. Furthermore, the discrimination of women needs to be changed, as we can see here today, with the women relegated to the back. That sort of segregation is not good for anyone. And if you say, well, we're separate but equal, there is no example in history of separate but equal. That's what the apartheid supporters said in South Africa. There was no equality between blacks and whites. Segregating men and women makes one sex oppressed compared to the other. We see it in the strict demands on women's, women concerning their clothing and their behavior, and in regulating their education and choice of professions, which is something that Islamnet has attempted to do by giving advice on what studies are suitable for women, what professions are suitable for women in Norway. There is discrimination of non-believers, unequal rights, according to interpretations of Islam, unacceptable. You have the discrimination of sexual minorities with the emphasis in certain circumstances of the death penalty, but in practice, in most countries, social exclusion. Chase them away. They are not part of us anymore. We don't want to have anything to do with them. 
The change of these attitudes and practices should mus move Muslims in the direction of greater freedom and equality. Freedom and equality for all. That is what I would call liberalization. When I advocate liberalization of Islam, I am not talking about replacing Islam with political liberalism. That's a different matter. That would mean abolishing Islam and establishing political philosophy of a certain kind as a substitute religion, if that would be possible at all. I am talking about the verb, the process. Then to liberal, liberalize means, according to dictionaries, to make something such as a law or a political or religious system less strict, or to make or become liberal. Then what is liberal or someone who is liberal? Not necessarily some, someone who embraces the political philosophy of liberalism. Again, according to a dictionary, a liberal is someone willing to understand and respect other people's behavior, opinions, etc., especially when they are different from your own. Believing people should be able to choose how they behave or wanting to or wanting or allowing a lot of political economic freedom and supporting gradual social, political or religious change. That are reasonable definitions of a liberal person and liberalizing processes are movement in that direction. These processes and attitudes are or should be compatible with various interpretations of Islam. The theological resources for interpretation in such a liberal and therefore liberalizing direction are, <clears throat> are there in Islam. The interpretive principle of ijtihad can be used and supplemented with the principle of the common good, maslaha, as resources for interpretive change. However, currently it is narrow and confining interpretations that have the theological and ideological hegemony in the Muslim world. Thus, ijtihad is often limited to qiyas, analogical reasoning, and not used in an innovative and progressive, as an innovative and progressive principle, which could, in union with maslaha, be the basis for a more dynamic understanding of the sharia, and therefore make Islam more compatible with the modern world, including modern science and human rights. But, and this is important, it is for Muslims to decide how they want to live. This is a right according to modern and liberal values, i.e. human rights. It is a basic human right. You have the right to decide for yourself. Nevertheless, because it is possible to make these changes, I hope and I argue for a process of liberalization that is based on recognition of the equal human dignity and worth of every human being, a process that accepts the best instruments we have to protect every human being's dignity, namely human rights. And the, log and the logical attachment to uh, equal human dignity and human rights is democracy. Thus, interpretations of Islam that embrace equal human dignity, human rights, and democratic political organization of states and societies is what I would say represents much needed liberalization of traditional Islam. And if the liberalization of Islam in its various interpretations today, including the so-called traditional interpretations, were steered by a free and liberal practice of ijtihad inspired by maslaha, we would see a gradual reduction in the segregation of the sexes, greater tolerance for differences within the Muslim <coughs> community, acceptance of non-believers, including marriage, marriages across religions, freedom of religion and the right to change religion without social sanctions, freedom of religion for children, acceptance of sexual minorities, respect for fuller freedom of expression and acceptance of what some might see as blasphemy, acceptance of critique of Islam, of course, with the right to a vigorous defense hopefully based on reason. An important part of <clears throat> this process of liberalization is based on freedom of religion. 
for everyone. Thus, those Muslims who want to live their lives in different ways, in stricter ways, are absolutely allowed to do so. Nevertheless, they have to accept the rights of others to criticize their interpretations and their ways of living. And conservative, traditional, or strict Muslims should not try to force other Muslims to change to their ways of living. They can use persuasion because also the strict, conservative, traditional, or so-called true Muslims are free to use their freedom of religion and freedom of expression to influence others. This is exactly why we need to respect the rights of others, Muslims and non-Muslims, to live their lives as they wish. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lars, for your presentation. So we will now have the introduction of uh, Mohammed Hijab. So you may come to the podium, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you guys hear me? This is a bit low. Shall I bring it up a bit? Is this better? Is it better or is it too loud? All right. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gould, for your presentation. It was a bit more moderate than your previous presentations, I must admit, um, with other debates that I've seen of yours. So I appreciate the more nu the nuance that you put into uh, the discussion. Let's start with definitions because I think this is a point of difference actually between me and Ghul. Um, Ghule. Ghule said that the definitions that he took were from dictionaries. Vernacular definitions or dictionary definitions are invariably influenced by ideological ones. And so I would put to him that dictionary definitions are actually influenced by political and social outcomes around, um, around those particular definitions when they're being written. In order to avoid such bias, one has to go before the 16th century, for example, when liberalism was around, and find definitions then. That would be, uh, I think, an appropriate recourse for someone who wants to use a dictionary definition. However, what I would say is that Dr. Goulet went on to talk about human rights, which is actually an outgrowth of liberalism. Human rights is an outgrowth of liberalism. You cannot understand human rights without understanding liberalism. Therefore, the liberalism that we are talking about is the social liberalism that is the political philosophy that was well introduced by John Locke, one could argue, some say Thomas Hobbes, and has a tradition all the way up to this day. And so th my definition of liberalism is actually a politically philosoph philosophical one, which I'm sure he'll be able to resonate with being a philosopher himself. Traditional Islam, I agree with Dr. Goulet. We, no one has a monopoly of traditional Islam. So for example, I follow the Hanbalite school of law. I can't say that my school of law is the only correct one, I understand that there is different strands of traditional Islam. Mu'tazilis were accepted as part of the Ijma, for example, and that's even mentioned by Ibn Taymiyyah, who is a literalist, as many of you know. So I accept the nuance there. I don't disagree with him. I don't think anyone has a monopoly of traditions, traditional Islam. So I think that's the first thing. The, the second thing I want to put to Dr. Goulet is, that before we say that we should move into a liberalizing direction, I think it's very fair to ask the question, how can we prove that liberalism is true in the first place? And of course, John Locke, who was the founding father of liberalism, had an essay or a book that he wrote where he talked about morality. And in that, he said that morality is something which is, you can be demonstrated like mathematics. He said that you can prove the truth of morality in the same way as you can, truth, you can prove scientific truths or mathematical or logical truths. In his own system, he said that liberalism is true and he gave theological reasons for it. He replied to Robert Filmer, for example, who was a Christian, and he was using God as the example. So in other words, he was using an anchorage, a moral epistemological anchorage, which was theological. And of course, the liberal tradition is not just John Locke. So across time, there has been different philosophers, all of which have tried different things in order to anchor their respective moral philosophy. So we have John Stuart Mill, we have John Rawls, D. Tocqueville, 
Montesquieu, all of these individuals wrote books and there is a vast, there is a uh, rich tradition of referring back to a particular underpinning, whether it be utilitarianism, the hedonistic principle or whatever. But in any of those cases, liberalism has proven to be a creature of convention. What did you say? I said liberalism is a creature of convention, meaning it's a subjective morality, something which is and has been the subject of change. It's not an objective morality. Therefore, before we even proceed in this conversation, you have to prove to me that liberalism is true. I mean, you had a debate with Hamza Zorza some time ago about God's existence. 54 minutes into the debate, Dr. Goulet said, there is no scientific evidence of God. Just bear that in mind. There is no scientific evidence of God is a problem with his understanding of philosophy of science. But where is the scientific evidence for liberalism? You, you can't have one standard of truth when you're trying to discover one system of morality and then disband that, discard that, completely throw that out when you're talking about your own beliefs, which are axiomatic, otherwise unprovable. So before you tell us to be liberal, why don't you prove liberalism? Stop preaching to us and start proving to us. That's the reality. You have taken the stance of an ideologue, a liberal ideologue, preacher. Don't be a preacher. Be a teacher. Don't be. Don't preach. Prove. I want to learn. Give me some proofs. However, what we saw in the second half of the presentation was Dr. Gul or Goulet, is that he started talking about discrimination, human rights, and all of those things. And he mentioned the death penalty. Here's my claim. And I stand in front of everyone today with full confidence that this claim will not be refuted. Listen to the claim. Liberalism can and has and is. Wait a minute. Now you're using too many words. Let me rewind. rewind. Liberalism can and has and is capable of producing death penalty outcomes for non-allegiance to the state, for example. Hudud, the laws, barbaric, outdated, dysfunctional laws, which is a genetic fallacy, by the way. And you should know as a philosopher that presenting cases like this is weak. Then he mentioned democracy, which is even, it's even older than Prophet Muhammad. So it's even more outdated. So it should be even more wrong in your understanding. But then here's what I'm saying to you. The point is this. Liberalism can allow. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, liberal contractarianism or contractualism, which is the only liberalism that you will find on the face of the earth, assumes that we had a primordial state of nature and that we entered into a primordial barter where we traded our freedom for the security of the state. Meaning what? The sovereign becomes the ultimate authority. John Locke his, himself said in his letters of toleration, ironically, that if someone in a Jewish state, John Locke, the founding father of liberalism, someone in a Jewish state apostatizes, disbelieves in Judaism, he is to be killed. Wait a minute. Is this Prophet Muhammad? No, 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 no. This is John Locke, the founding father of liberalism, which is the very ideology you are trying to preach to us today. This, of course, did not stop at Locke. It continued to mill. Continued all the way up to rules, actually. Immanuel Kant. All of these individuals have messages similar to that, that you have to fully obey the, the sovereign. Listen to this. Listen to this. Me and you. I was born in London 28 years ago. You were born maybe 29 years ago. I don't know. In Norway. And, and what happened was, I didn't get a choice. Did you get a choice that you had to obey the law or not? Or to be a citizen or not? I was just forced into the social contract. Freedom of expression and freedom of religious expression and freedom of thought and so on and so forth. All of that was curtailed at the very starting point for me. I didn't choose to be here 
and to be a citizen and obey the law, yet I have to be, obey the law. The point is the social contract is, is dominant. And therefore, when the law is in place, I have to follow the law. If the law is that there's treason, which is associated with some kind of religious authority, then that is the law. Therefore, it's conceivable through liberalism to have death penalty outcomes philosophically. And by the way, it's also conceivable in Islam, as he alluded to, to be fair to him, that you don't have to have death penalty outcomes for a public apostasy in an Islamic state. Let me give you the evidence for that. Some brothers are going to say, wait a minute, you, now you become liberal. No, no. No, no. For example, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith in Bukhari, where he was talking to the people of, in Hudaybiyah, he spoke to Suhail ibn Amr, and there was a pact that he created. Suhail ibn Amr, who was the leader of the Qurayshis at that time, said that if anyone apostatizes, even publicly, the assumption was, then they are to be not killed, but returned to us. The Prophet agreed to that. Now the question is, is this still applicable today? Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyyah he mentions in Zaid al-Ma'ad, just as al-Mirdawi, also pronounced Mardawi, Mentions as well in his books, not Al-Insaf, the other one. He wrote another big book, which I can give the references after. He mentions that this is still applicable today. So it's not been abrogated. In other words, it's conceivable fully to have a fully fledged Islamic state where there is no war and someone apostates in public and there is no death penalty outcome. Why? Is that despite what the Prophet Muhammad said and because of liberalism? No, no. This is because of what Prophet Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Therefore, it's conceivable in Islam for such punishments to be waived as well as implemented fairly, and in liberalism for such punishments to be waived or implemented. So what's the issue? The issue is you're actually calling us to something which we don't need. We have within our own system. The point is this, as he said correctly, if there's maslaha, the jurists can and have argued to that effect. Now let's look at something else. A point I wanted to make here, which I think we need to be very clear on, is not to have colonial amnesia. The most bloody massacres in human history, and I say this with full confidence, have been perpetrated by liberal states. Let's take one example, 1830, the French annexation of Algeria. One million people were killed, genocidal. And by the way, I was a history teacher in the UK for some time. Never did we teach this and it wasn't even on the national curriculum. But we teach about the Holocaust, those kinds of genocides. Why? Because the French were adamant on censoring this information because it included rape, pillaging, of human beings and pictures are there because this was a time where pictures could be actually generated. Many Muslims don't even know what happened in Algeria for 130 years by a government, a French government, which was not only liberal, listen to this, but the founding fathers of that liberal government and philosophers like Alexis de Tocqueville in his essays to Algiers actually supported the colonial discrimination against who? The Algerians. Because of what? because of the superiority complex that they had. And this is, to be honest, what we find in the discourse, a superiority complex where you don't even have an objective morality to, 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 to give us. So the point is this, listen to this, liberalism has, can allow for racism and colonialism and tyranny and authoritarianism, whereas Islam can never, I'm not saying has never, but can never, as a religion, can never allow for racism. So the question shouldn't really be, now if you, if you like racism, liberalism can't stop you from being racist. Let me say that one more time. Liberalism as a political philosophy cannot and has not, through its principles or its actions, stop you from being a racist. And if it could, then surely the founding fathers, surely those who came after them and those who came after them wouldn't have allowed a race-based slavery to exist. Race-based slavery in America until the Civil War, which, by the way, killed the mo most people in American history in terms of wars. So this is a colonial amnesia 
which I think people are having, and forgetting about the fact that most genocides that have been committed in history have been by li massive genocides have been by liberal states in the in the in the recent history. The Native Americans, what happened to them? Native America, Native Americans, and what happened to them is is basically ISIS on steroids. If you, if you don't like ISIS, you shouldn't like... I mean, imagine 100 years from now, you speak to an ISIS person, and they say, this is our state, we've overtook it from the people. No one would accept it, but now America is basically premised, is, is built on the same kind of genocide. And that's the reality. This is liberalism for you, yeah? Westwood expansion, manifest destiny, these were all liberal concepts. Please, don't try it. We know your history. We know your history very well. And we know your present as well. And the question now is, it, can it be legalistically justified? You know, I did some research, which I'm going to publish soon, inshallah. Maybe a week or two. I did some re research on the amount of times the hudud have been implemented in the Ottoman Empire. Of course, there are gaps in the record, but it has actually been digitized and archived. And my understanding is, from the years 1500 to 1700, there was only two or three cases. And by the way, there was no death penalty outcomes for a lot of them. From the years 1700 to 1856, which is when the Tanzimat took place, when actually in 1839, in 1839 they basically stopped Sharia law as being the arbitrator in, in the judiciary in, in the Ottoman Empire. In that period of time you saw the most, but most of them, once again through Maslaha and other reasons, were stopped. Now look at America, treason is, I believe, and not me, the scholars of Islam like a Sarahsi, he mentions in his Mabsut, he, they say that Ridda is equivalent to high treason. America, in 1862, William Mumford, he tore down an American flag. Now, notice that this was not an act of militancy. This was an act of symbolism. He tore down an American flag. This was after Abraham Lincoln and all the founding fathers of liberalism who wrote the Federalist Papers, etc. in America. He tore down an American flag and was executed in front of a mass amount of people in New Orleans. Now, this is not militancy. So, is it conceivable? Yes. Has it been shown in history? Yes. Even through the law. So, liberalism doesn't produce non-death penalty outcomes. That's fake. That's false. We're not going to believe in that. That's fake. History hasn't proven that. Bring your evidence. And so, the present is even worse. Because they don't even use the treatise clause in the second, the second article of the Constitution of America. And they do extrajudicial killings. And by the way, those extrajudicial killings and the suspension of habeas corpus uh, rights are sometimes navigated and mitigated through the liberal constitutional rights. And then you have people like Hal al Awlaq, he's a six year old who was killed by Americans by drones. Yes, by drones. Killing a child because they're afraid that she'll turn out like her father without any trial. This is liberalism for you in action. Don't talk to us about liberalism. And does Islam need to be liberal and outdated? Democracy is much older than Prophet Muhammad's uh, time. And he mentioned it as outdated, as if some kind of argument. This is dysfunctionality in, in argumentation, actually, to use his phrase. Moreover, liberalism is contradictory with itself. Pluralism says that you can use, for example, your religious expression and so on to express yourself in society. Secularity or secularism doesn't allow that. So if I'm a Muslim and I want to use my religious belief systems to influence policy, that's not allowed to me by secularity or secularism, but it is allowed by pluralism. So there's contradictions. What if something which is democratic contradicts something which is liberal? What do you do in that situation? So here, the truth is, there is nothing you can say at all to convince us in the same way as many colonial forefathers, not of himself, I'm just saying of the Western people in general, used to come to our countries and tell us to believe in what they believe. And just like in Algeria, we rejected this because they did not provide any proof for what they believe. And today, we're finding the same thing again. You're not providing any proof. So what I'm going to conclude with is a list of just three questions. The second one has sub-compartments, which hopefully the professor will answer. Number one is straightforward. Give us proof of liberalism. What kind of demonstrative proof have you got? Logical. Give me a rational 
argument using mantiq or logic. Give me a mathematical argument, a scientific one. You can't just produce, say, be liberal. It's like coming here and say, be communist. It's ridiculous. Give me some proof. Number two, give us evidence for the presuppositions of liberalism. You mentioned equality and freedom. How can you even prove that freedom exists as an atheist materialist? I'm not sure if you're a materialist or not. Let alone being a desirable thing. You have to prove this. Equality, that's against the theory of Darwinian evolution. We're not born equal. That's what, that's what is mentioned in the documents. Like the, the, the United, uh, for example, the United States Constitution. Or the, sorry, the Declaration of Independence. But how can you prove that we're all born equal? John Locke said that we're endowed that equality from God. As an atheist, how can you prove equality? Prove it. Prove to us that we're born equal. That freedom exists. That it's a desirable thing. And that individual rights should be prioritized over collective rights. Which is the basis for most moral liberal systems. You have to prove this. And do you admit that liberalism is capable of producing legally binding death penalty outcomes for non-allegiance to the state, for example? And if so, how do you suppose liberalism solves a so-called problem that is created by Islam? Please answer those questions. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Muhammad Hijab, for your presentation. We will now have the rebuttal session where Dr. Lash will have 10 minutes to give his uh, comments on what uh, Muhammad Hijab have spoken and you will have your time on the timer in front of them. So without any further ado. Thank you. Um, I must say that I'm uh, <clears throat> surprised by uh, the mixing here of uh, norm and fact by Mr. Hijab. Because he assumes that we can prove normativity, norms, in the same way that we prove the existence of the sun or that we are here today. These are two completely different areas, two different spheres. We don't use the same sort of logic. We don't use the same sort of arguments when we are discussing norms and when we are discussing facts, reality, the descriptive part of reality. So here is a confusion, a confusion that he brings with him into his presentation of the liberalist tradition. I am not in that tradition. I find parts of it sympathetic, but he is, and it seems to me that he's reading every text as a Salafi, as something that is there, like the Quran, unchangeable for eternity. The whole point with the tradition in, polo in political philosophy is that it develops. Of course, we do think and say, liberals do think and say something different from what John Locke said. That is the whole point of a philosophical tradition, is that those who followed John Locke looked at what he wrote and saw, ah, he's mistaken. I can do better. We can improve. And those that followed him again says the same thing. So liberalism, now I'm speaking as a teacher, is different today than it was at John Locke's time. And to say that we have to go back to John Locke to understand liberalism is plainly nonsense. I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense because liberalists today say something else than what John Locke said and wrote. So, so here there is a confusion and actually a, a rather strange, if not to say naive presentation of uh, the liberal tradition in political uh, philosophy. Of course, people within the liberal tradition are affected by the circumstances. John Locke was a Christian. Many liberals, political liberals today, are not religious. They say and mean different things. And how the tradition, how the contradictions within the traditions has been addressed and changed. Mr. Hijab is quite correct. In the liberal tradition, there has been racist, racist attitudes, there has been arguments for the death penalty, it has been practiced and, liber and legitimized, justified by liberals. 
today. If we say that liberal political philosophy, liberal political thinking is predominant, and there is a case for that, in the Western world today, look at Europe today. They have all abolished the death penalty. So, to argue that John Locke was in favor of the death penalty 400 years ago, uh, and relating that to liberalism today is simply absurd. Doesn't make any sense. Because liberalism today is completely different. And then, what about? You cannot avoid it. Because if you are saying that Islam is Islam and it's perfect from the beginning, and that is absolute, there is no relativity here. It's the same throughout the centuries, because the basis is the same. The Quran is the same, and the Sunnah is there. Yes. What about today? No, you cannot, you cannot justify racism in Islam. About the equal number of slaves transported to the Americas was captured and sold from Africa into the Muslim world over several centuries. Wasn't that racism? And if you think it disappeared well some time ago because today we preach a more enlightened form of Islam, you're wrong. Some of you with black skin, having been in the Middle East, would know that. Skin racism, skin color racism, racism is still prevalent in the Middle East. Don't tell me otherwise. I have spoken to blacks, black Muslims studying Islam in Syria, telling me how they have faced racism in that country amongst Muslims. And if you say that, well, the West, they have been do, committing atrocities, it is true. And who, who are those who have addressed those atrocities, critiqued them, made interpretations of politics change? Well, they are the same people in the West criticizing France for its occupation of Algeria. Where are the Muslims protesting against Saudi Arabia? Muslims killing children, Muslim children, in Yemen today. Where are they? Where are all the Muslims protesting against Saudi Arabia's killing of Khashoggi a year ago? Don't tell me that, oh, you are to blame for this and that colonialism. What about Islamic colonialism? What about Islamic imperialism? Oh, no, we just spread the word. We didn't use soldiers at all. We didn't conquer Spain, you know. We just persuaded the Spaniards to become Muslims. I am not the one who says that Islam was ma mainly spread by the sword, because that is not true. But it was also spread by the sword. Jihad fi sabil ala. Don't tell me otherwise. So if you are saying that your interpretations of this and that political philosophy is different from, then you are comparing bad Western practices with Islamic ideals. You're not looking at Islamic practices and comparing them with Western ideals. And that is also a fallacy. Finally, there are many things that could be said here, but, uh, but finally, when it comes to the liberal tradition, Again, Mr. Rejab is asking for proofs, and he's saying that uh, liberalism is based on a fallacy, on something that cannot be proven. That, that's true. No one pretended that the state of nature could be proven, at least not today. It might have been a, a hypothesis that Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, thought was plausible, also in the empirical sense not least because of the colonial experience. But the fact is that when most of the liberal theoreticians talk about a state of nature, it is a hypothesis. It's a logical hypothesis they use to establish premises that you can use to argue in favor of certain moral ethical principles. We're not talking about facts. We are talking about norms, we are talking about the basis for a logical argument that can justify individual freedom. The states need to withdraw from total domination 
of the individual and so on. So uh, again, there is a confusion of the empirical and the normative in Mr. Hijab's presentation, which I find very, very strange. Finally, if there is such a thing that, well, we are influenced by this and that, and we have the colonial past, and uh, colonialism is wrong. Why? Why is colonialism wrong? I would like to have Mr. Hijab answer that. Because if he says it's wrong because, and I agree with him, then we have something common. In spite his religious starting point and my non-religious starting point, and that is what is interesting me. So, to comment on the questions, and I cannot do but comment on them, I don't need to give proofs of liberalism. It doesn't make any sense. First of all, I'm not a liberalist in the philosophical sense. And second, it is a sort of system that cannot be given proofs. It can be shown to be consistent or inconsistent. And because of certain of its inconsistencies, I am not a political liberal. <clears throat> so, the, and I've just commented on the evidence of liberalism's presupposition, the state of nature, born equal, etc. Born equal, yes. Are you saying that we are not born equal? That is also a hypothesis. Of course, when, when Rousseau said that we were born equal, he did not necessarily mean that in a literal, empirical sense. But he said, when the baby comes out of the mother, they are equal. Some grow up slaves, some grow up as laborers, some will be princes and rulers. Of course he knew that. He wasn't a stupid man. But he made a premise that you have to argue why we are not equal. That is the important thing. So liberalism can produce various outcomes, as we have seen. But so will Islam, as we have seen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lash, for your rebuttal. Now we will have Mohammed Hijab giving his 10 minutes of comments. So I'm very happy with that, actually. A lot of that is exactly what I wanted to hear. He said, liberalism cannot be proven. And then he said, we're born equal. And he said to me, the burden is, uh, of proof is on me. But actually, no, the burden of proof is on the one who's making the claim. The burden of proof is not on me to prove why we're not equal, because that's demonstrative. When we're born out of the mother's womb, some of us are tall, Tall, dark, and handsome like myself. <laughs> and some of us are... <laughs> yes. And some of us are not. And so, I'm not saying you, right? And so on. Okay? No. What are we equal in? We're not equal in physical characteristics. We're not equal in opportunities. Some of us are born in different geographic locations. Some of us are born in, in the east, west, north, south, wherever it may be. What is equal about our opportunities or our physical characteristics. From a strictly scientific perspective, there's nothing equal about how we're born at all. No, the burden of proof is not on me. The burden of proof is definitely on you. Now, having said that, we do believe in an equal spiritual opportunity from an Islamic perspective. We can say that by arguing from first principles. The problem is, you can't argue from first principles as admitted by yourself because you need an a systemic vantage point which doesn't have the end as the beginning. This is how you argue in your debates. You start by saying human rights is a good thing, but you have no way of proving that according to your own admission. Your understanding of human rights, you cannot say I'm not a liberal now because you've been promoting human rights all your life. That's what you've been doing. How can you not be a liberal and human rights is a birth child of liberalism is a birth child of liberalism and you've been promoting it, harassing Muslims in debates, telling them you have to be this and you have to be that, and you cannot even prove human rights because you cannot even prove its seedbed, epistemic seedbed, which is liberalism. Don't run away from the question saying that liberalism in his definition is lack of strictness. Well, I can say, the Prophet said, don't be strict. But that's according to our understanding, our jurisprudential understanding of strictness. You have to have a... When you say strict, what do you mean? You're talking about post-enlightenment ideas. 
This is perfect. This is the trap mode. And then he tried to say, because right now he's running away from it. Sorry to say, I'm not trying to push you into a corner. But what I am saying is, he came today and tried to equivocate. It's called the fallacy of equivocation. Use the, the, the dictionary definition of the word liberalism when all his life he's been using the political philosophical definition of liberalism. And by the way, the dictionary definition is informed by the political definition to run away from proving what he has to prove. That's the reality of what's happened today. Then he says, talks about discrimination. Now he's confusing feminism with liberalism. He says, why are women in the back and men in the front? This is a second wave feministic interrogation. Why should we go for a second wave feministic interrogation, not a third wave feministic interrogation, which would ask you, by a third wave feminist would ask you, how do you know they're women? Have you asked for their pronouns? No, honestly, honestly, how do you know? I mean, a queer studies theory would say that. So you're trying to force us. You don't even know what you're arguing for. That's the reality of the situation. You've come here with a gun with no bullets. And you've shot at the wrong man. Because the reality is now you're being questioned on your own ideology. He says, John Locke, liberalism has changed since John Locke. If you listen to what I said, I said, I don't care what John Locke said. I said, it's the principles of liberalism. I use John Locke as a supporting argument, not as a main argument saying that everything that John Locke says is liberalism. I said that contractarian forms of liberalism, or otherwise we're referred to as contractual forms, which are the only forms you'll see in the whole wide world. Give me one Robert Nozick style utopian anarchy in his book, I'm sure you've read it. Non-contractarian form of uh, liberalism on the earth today, you won't find it. Therefore, what's happened today is, it's as if I was debating someone about Christianity and Trinity and say, look, actually, I don't really believe in Christianity. I only believe in parts of it. So, I, of course, you're going to run away from the question because you have to prove yourself at this point. And when neoliberal, yes, orientalist commentators are questioned on their principles, they retreat. They run away from answering. And if they do answer, they'll be honest, like he has been, to be fair. He says, I, I can't prove this. And at the end, he tried to kind of run away from it and say, actually, you have to prove that we're not born equal. But actually, no, you have to prove that we are equal. Because that's a metaphysical equality. It's a metaphysical equality. It's not a physical one. You can't argue that we're physically e equal. We're definitely not. So if it's a metaphysical claim, it requires metaphysical proofs. You have to provide that. He says, well, there's a racism in the Middle East. I agree with you. But there's racism against black people and racism against Filipinos and racism against, you know, even Arabs are racist against themselves. And racism is a problem. And I agree with all of what you said there. I don't have any agree uh, disagreement with you on these points. But that's a straw man. I didn't say anything about it. I'm not here to defend the Middle East. If I was here defending the Middle East, I'm, I promise you he'd win the debate. I'm here to defend Islam. Qal Allah wa Rasul. Allah and the Messenger. I don't care what the Muslims do. Muslims are only uh, are applicable to the discussion if they form part of the Ijma'ah. For example, in a jurisprudential sense. He says... Islamic colonialism. Well, look, even if there was Islamic colonialism, I was made very clear. I can't hear, uh, stand here and defend 1,400 years of Islamic history. Very clearly, if there was Islamic colonialism with the connotations that it implies, and you are asking me to condemn it, which is uh, misappropriation of land, taking people out of their homes, and so, that's wrong. We don't believe in that, but we do believe in an age of empire where there was a medieval realist form in an international relations perspective of power relations, if you know your neighbor is about to take you over and you have two choices as a government, then it's not morally objectionable from my perspective to offer them the ultimatum first. It's not a UN style uh, situation where we can uh, agree. And Islam says, Islam says if there are peace treaties in place to stop that from happening and we're sure that our neighbors will not do that, then those peace treaties must be respected. So if, the, if my neighbor, if I was living in the medieval period, and my neighbor, my geographic neighbor said, I'm not going to you know, come into you, try and overtake you, you don't overtake us, and there was an agreement, I would say, it's haram, wrong, morally unacceptable for them to invade. But unless the neighbor can provide such guarantees, then I would say it becomes uh, possible and an option in that, in, that, uh, in that context. Because you either get eat, you either eat or you're going to get eaten. As you would say in a, in, a in a biological sense, Darwinian sense. So really, these are the points. And he said that men and women, let's take, let's take the gender, uh, the dichotomous second wave feminist uh, thing. 
How is that discrimination against women? I swear men and women get exactly the same. Like, if men can't go into women's area, women can't go into men's area. Isn't that the same? Isn't that the rights of men and women are exactly the same in that situation? How can you say that that's discrimination against women? It doesn't make any sense because if the same rules apply to men to women, then that's, that's actually a form of equality. Now the question is, why do you allow certain separations in certain contexts? I'm from UK. We have girls' schools, boys' schools. That's an educational setting. This is an educational setting. I've never seen you condemn that. Why don't you condemn that? Why don't you condemn certain separated... Uh, why? Because the white man said so. That's the reality. When the white liberal man decides this is an acceptable form of separation which has no problem with our sensibilities, then we have to uh, uh, hear سَمَعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We have to hear and obey the colonial overlord. No, that's weak. Give us some proof. You've just come here and said, well, John Locke, liberalism has changed, therefore run away. No, you come here to a debate that is entitled, does Islam need to be liberalized? You need to show us first why liberalism is true and desirable before you can convince us of that. I know that Muslims have a bad track record, but what I'll say to you is this. As Muslims, what are we calling you to? In the last minute, I'll say this. We're calling you to... Forget about the hedonistic principle where the procurement of pleasure is the main thing. We're saying constrict your pleasures. In the same way as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has constricted the laws of the heavens and the earth, has constricted the laws of nature, we're saying as Muslims we would rather constrict ourselves and our behavior, constrain our behaviors in line with the divine guidance. Allah says in the Quran, which is actually a response to liberalism, I believe. By the other blemish, he says, وَلَوْ اتَّبَعَ الْحَقُّ وَهُوَاءَهُمْ لَفَسَدَتِ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِنْ بَلْ لَتَيْنَاهُمْ بِذِكْرِهِمْ فَهُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِهِمْ مُعْرِضُونَ If the heavens and the earth had followed their desires, everything in the heavens and the earth would have been destroyed. We have come with the reminder. The reminder is to follow Allah's laws instead of following your own whims and desires, which is the essence of liberalism. The hedonistic principle. And then you'll find meaning in life. We should change the title today after this discussion to Should Liberalism Be Islamicized? Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa Thank you, Muhammad Hijab, for your rebuttal. We will now have our cross-examination where each speaker will have one minute to phrase his question to his opponent and, and the other speaker will have three minutes to answer his question and each speaker will be given three questions each. After that we will open up the floor for the questions from the audience. So we will start with Dr. Lash with his first question that he would like to ask uh, Muhammad Hijab. I have um, uh, just a couple of, uh, of questions. First, uh, I didn't think it was necessary to emphasize that I actually know that there are differences between men and women when they are born, black and white. We know that some people will be big and burly, some will be short. Of course, again, that this has to do with physical real reality, and that's not when, what we're talking about when we're talking about human dignity and human worth. And it is in that respect that we are equal. And my question, first question is, are we of equal worth regardless, men, women, born from believers or unbelievers in this normative sense? Okay, to answer that question directly, we are born equal. So the, um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the hadith, from our perspective, Kullu mawludun yuladu ala fitrati That every born baby is born among with the fitra. <clears throat> fitra is a disposition to believe in God. So from a spiritual perspective, we're all equal. Uh, and we are not to be punished as well, unless we have equal opportunity to receiving the message. So Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولَهِ In chapter 17, verse number 15. We were not going to punish them until we send prophets. 
And by extension, that means we're not going to punish them until we send someone to tell them the message of Tawheed, which should resonate with them instantaneously from a monotheistic perspective because we have an implanted um, primordial nature, or as Descartes put it, an autograph of God in us, which obviously we don't accept the phraseology of that, but the idea is, is that we have a receptivity, to use Justin Barrett's terms, who in fact, Justin Barrett, um, if I'm saying his name correctly, he was the lead project uh, lead in Oxford University in the Anthropological Society in 2011, who concluded through um, basically checking out young children that we do have, in his words, an innate receptivity to believe in God or in higher power. So from these perspectives, from both an empirical perspective and an experiential one, we have good evidence to prove that we are born believing in a higher power. And from an Islamic perspective, therefore, we are born equal in terms of dignity and in terms of worth, value. No child born to, for example, disbelieving parents is any less valuable from that perspective than a child born to believing parents. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith, Rufi al qalam an thalath. He says that the pen has been lifted upon three people. And na'im hatta yistayqith, the sleeping person until he's woke up. Was sabiyu hatta yahlum, and the uh, and the child until they become pubescent, well, majnoon hatta yaqil, and the the uh, basically the insane until they become sane. So, Islam is a religion which can anchor your belief system to a spiritual, metaphysical type of equality. Now he's right. He said that physically we're not equal, but he's making a metaphysical claim. You see, the point I was making was it's impossible unless you argue from first principles convincingly with a systemic vantage point other than that which your end goal in mind first, which is a circular type of reasoning, to prove on liberalism or any other ideology that we are born equal from a metaphysical perspective. And that was exactly the point. So I agree with him, physically we're different, but metaphysically, which is what he's talking about, you can't prove that we're equal, but we can. Thank you, Mohammed Hijab, for your answer. Now you will have one minute to phrase your question to Dr. Lash. Okay. Um, I found it quite bizarre, to be honest, uh, to be fair to you, Dr. Goulet, that you tried to use dictionary definitions um, to escape defending the ideology that you've been promulgating for many years in this country with the proof of many debates that you've had, for example, on human rights. I found it even more bizarre that when I checked the dictionary, when it used the word liberalize, some dictionary definition actually said, especially in regards to politics and econom economics. My question is, how do you, def how do you decide what definition you're going to base your arguments of. For example, we use the word liberalize, but another word is religion. Emil Durkheim, who is seen as like the founding father of sociology, said religion encompass any meta ideas, which include liberalism, actually. So from this perspective, how can you, and why would you choose some selective definitions over others to escape from answering questions? Thank you. Mohammed, for, for yes, Lash. <clears throat> when we use definitions we try to fill concept concepts with meaning and a concept is not true or false a concept cannot be proven it is not a premise in a logical argument as such a concept is something that should be relevant and should be of interest to the subject matter that we are trying to understand this is difficult but it is also very important because many things that definitions are true or false, they are not. They are chosen. They should not be chosen arbitrarily. They should be relevant to the subject that we are discussing, investigating. This is very important. And when I am asked the question, should Islam be liberalized? And I myself is not an ardent defender of the political philosophy of liberalism, I'm looking at more or less common sense definition, what we call definitions of use. How, how can we understand liberalization in a common sense way? And then you can go to dictionaries. You will find 
nuances in those dictionaries and I made it very simple for myself because I googled and then comes up um, uh, Oxford's uh, internet dictionary and so on. Well, that was sufficient to make my point that we are talking about changing certain dogmas, beliefs, practices. That is my point. I don't have to prove premises or the basis. That, that, that is a very strange way of approaching this. It's a very Islamist way of approaching it. You can say that's, that's his right, okay. So, so be it. Uh, he can ask me to do that, but uh, I don't see that as uh, necessary. Just a point about my own position. Yes, I defined human rights, de defend human rights. I've been doing so for quite a number of years. And of course, there is a certain liberal element in that. I don't deny that. The history of human rights has been strongly influenced by political liberalism. But you don't have to be a political liberalist in order to defend human rights. You can be a social democrat, you can be a Marxist, you can be an anarchist. You can have many different positions. You can even be a Muslim and defend human rights. So you can defend those from many different perspectives. Coming to human worth, it was a very interesting answer because Mr. Najab has his position. It's given to us by God. Human worth and dignity is given to us by God. I have a different story about the origins of, of uh, human dignity and human rights. Then we have a liberal philosopher, John Rawls, who is talking about overlapping consensus. We disagree about the basic reasons, but we agree on the conclusion that we have human dignity and human, right, human worth as an inherent value, and that we can build on even if we agree, disagree on the causes or reasons behind um, that worth. Thank you, Dr. Gula. Uh, may you phrase your question to Mr. Hijab? Yes, it's very simple. Is colonialism wrong because God says so? Or do we have a common ground for saying that colonialism is wrong. Thank you, Dr. Lash. Thank you. Just to comment on what was just said, in terms of popular usage or academic usage, the word liberalize is certainly used to refer to popular political philosophy. And I'll give you some usages here. For example, a book with um, an anthology of different thinkers rec uh, recalled towards a, uh, an Islamic ref uh, reformation, civil liberties, human rights, and international law, this liberalized means the political philosophy. Asad uh, Talal uh, Asad, he wrote a book called Blasphemy, Injury, and Free Speech. Whenever he used the word liberalize, he's referring to the political philosophy. John Chavez, who is LSE professor, whenever he used the word liberalize, he used it as the political philosophy. Um, for example, Evans, who's, uh, who's is in Britain, he wrote a book called Liberal Terror. Whenever he used the word liberalize, he means the political philosophy. Gray, John Gray, when he wrote the book Black Mass, whenever he used the word liberalize, he means it in terms of political philosophy. So if we're talking about usage, I don't think you can argue that when people use the word liberalize in the English language, that that means to make things less strict. Even the dictionary, you said Oxford, says with particular reference to economics and politics. Now to answer your question directly, that we can say there's something called divine command theory, which is divine command theory. First, I should, I should premise this by saying there's a difference of opinion among Muslim scholars. That would be the most correct thing to say. So this is something called a taqbih wa tahseen in, in Islamic uh, moral theory. And some people have said that taqbih wa tahseen, or being able to discern morality uh, with fitra salima, is something which you can do intuitively. Ibn Taymiyyah said this, but he, pred he said that you can do it, you can find out intuitive morality only, but sometimes it's very difficult to realize what is actually socialized and what isn't socialized. So he says that in order for you to be sure, you have to go to the textual evidences. The Ash'ari school of thought are more in line with divine command theory. Mu'tazilis say it's they believe in taqbih al-tahseen. So there is a 
discussion among Muslim scholars. I can't tell you that this is the way and this is the truth. And the, there is a discussion. But in my understanding, I think a combination of views with Taqbih al Tahsin, Ibn Taymiyyah's view, what he said about Fitra, is true with divine command theory as well. I think that's true as well. So looking at what God said and looking at the Sunnah is not the only access point to morality. Yeah, so we do believe in intuitive, which is actually what John Locke believed is intuitive morality as well. Um, however, it's a, it's a way to sieve out um, those true moralities from false moralities. I think it's a bit of a complicated answer, but there you have it. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, uh, Mohammed Hijab. Would you pose your second question yes. to Dr. Gula? The third, the third question? <coughs> no, no, I only asked one question. How many questions? Yes, yeah, second for Hijab, that's what I said. Because you asked the first question. And you have one more question left, and he have one more question. Exactly, exactly. I have one more uh, question, and it will relate to uh, no, the but, very... But it's uh, Hijab's turn to ask now. Oh, sorry. Yes. It's okay. You're not trying to impinge on my freedom of speech, are you? <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, talking about freedom of speech, and put particularly the 30 articles of the human rights, which Lars Gule, Lars Gule has adamantly, vehemently defended in the past, which I maintain are liberal outgrowths. One of them is democracy. One of the you know, human rights is democracy. Now let me I'll give you a scenario, and I want you to answer this scenario. Would you consider it democratically legitimate if a state were to carry out a referendum and conclude that they want amputation for thieves as an appropriate punishment. And if not, why not? Thank you. The answer is no. And that is because of human rights. And the question is very relevant in the West, because we have had since 2001, a so-called war on terror. In that war on terror, the Americans found it reasonable. They tried to justify it through law, arguments, that we can torture suspects in the war on terror. Between 60 and 80% of Americans polled on this question said it was acceptable. It is not acceptable. You have no right to infringe the basic human rights of everyone, even the criminal, with the infliction of torture. That is an absolute prohibition in human rights. Totally unacceptable. So, if you say God has said we should amputate the hand of the thief, that is a clear example of how certain uh, commands in Islam are against human rights and therefore not compatible with modern human rights thinking. Actually, rather few states, including Muslim states, practice this. I think it was Habib Burgiba who said, no, it was actually, it was actually the second in command in uh, Libya, under Gaddafi, who had his special interpretation of Islam and he was criticized for that. Uh, but he said it was Islam and they should follow Islam in many ways. And uh, this guy was asked, why don't you amputate the hand of the thief? He said, no, we can't have a, we can't have, a, a, you know, a stock of laborers with only one hand. We need people who can work with both hands, which is a rational way of saying that it is an, a, a completely outdated uh, uh, method of, uh, of uh, punish punishment for rational reasons. But the main fact is that it is a cruel and inhumane um, punishment and therefore it should not be practiced. This represents a challenge and a problem for a number of Muslims who want to maintain that the will of God is clear and at the same time defend human rights. Very interesting person in this regard is, uh, is uh, Abdallahi An Naim, a Sudanese scholar, uh, who is trying to square the circle, uh, but recognizes that here there is an absolute challenge and opposition between modern human rights thinking and uh, certain demands of uh, 
الدشرية Thank you, Dr. Lash. You may pose your third and last question to yes. Mr. Hijab. That question <coughs> relates to the interesting uh, point you made about the various interpretations on human dignity and human worth, because then you were approaching uh, some of the rational arguments that we have human dignity and human worth because we are rational beings. And that leads me to a question, maybe more out of curiosity than uh, of specific relevance to the, this debate, but still, what do you think of the contributions of the philosophers in the Islamic tradition? I'm thinking about philosophers like Farabi, Ibn Sina, also Al-Ghazali, but not least Ibn Rushd, because they emphasized that should, as good Muslims, perhaps with the exception of Ghazali in this context, should, as good Muslims, we should use reason. And there, is, there should be no understanding of an opposition between reason and revelation. Thank you, Dr. Lash. Actually, I've written a book on this, which I want to give to you. This is available online on Amazon. It's called Kalam Cosmological Arguments. All the names you just mentioned are mentioned in the book. Ghazali, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd. I'm going to give you one over here. So this will answer your question in detail, hopefully. Um, and hopefully other books will come out on liberalism and apostasy, which I'm going to bring out uh, hopefully next week or the week after. And another one I'm going to, I've actually written called Fifth Wave Feminism. It's been peer-reviewed as well, so hopefully I can send you those over or something. Yeah. Um, so I'll quickly come back to something that was said and then answer your question directly. Um, the, the, the premise that barbarity equals falsity, because we heard he says something about cutting the hands off. He says it's barbaric, cruel and barbaric, I think that's right. Cruel and inhumane, that's the words he used. But just because something is cruel, it doesn't mean it's false. That's a fallacy, actually. That's, that is a fallacious kind of reasoning. Barbarity does not equal falsity. And in fact, war is an industry of barbarity and cruelty. War is an industry of barbarity and cruelty. And unless you're a pacifist, you endorse that, that kind of barbarity and that kind of cruelty. You actually went and tried to get involved in it yourself. I mean, so, so who, who gets to decide which kind of barbarity and cruelty is legitimate and which kind of barbarity and cruelty is illegitimate? And moreover, another thing is here, we talked about um, the vote, you know, if, if a Muslim country, for example, voted that they wanted the amputation of the thieves of the hand, should, well, he said it's against human rights, but I don't, of the 30 articles, I don't see the right to have a hand as one of them. Actually, the right to have a vote was one of them, and the right for a state to be sovereign is another one. So here you have clear contradictions between human rights, which is what my esteemed interlocutor is not telling us, that these human rights, which are predicated on axiomatic, unprovable, first premises are actually human rights which are outgrowth of liberalism and which have no proof as we've seen, seen today. Moreover, they contradict each other. Sovereignty of state versus democracy versus life versus... These are, this is why I asked them the question. Because if you say, well, even if 99% of the population don't want, uh, sorry, they want amputation of hands of thieves, we're not gonna have it. This is in fact going against the human right of democracy. So you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it both. It's going to be a contradiction, I'm afraid. You're going to have to endure that contradiction. As for Ghazali and Sina and stuff, amazing scholars, as I say, you can read the book. Ghazali wrote to Hafez al-Falasifa. Um, and I think they all had an incredible um, impact on one another. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd read the book for sure. That would give you an insight because I can't, I can't do it in two, in two minutes, I think. It's very difficult. Thank you, Mr. Hijab. You may pose your third and last question to Dr. Gula. Okay. I think you conceded that slavery, colonialism, racism, and punitive punishments are all principally conceivable in a liberal state. If so, as a defender of human rights, which is an outgrowth of liberalism, why do you use them as main arguments against Islam? Sorry, let me, let me say that one more time. Can I repeat it? Yeah. So I said, 
I think in the course of your presentation, you conceded that slavery, colonialism, um, racism, etc., punitive punishments are all possible, conceivably possible, in a state which is liberal, or even says that we follow human rights, a state that predicates itself on human rights values. Therefore, if this is the case, what use is, how, isn't it fruitless to try and call us to this? Because the conceivability of it being implemented does not change. In fact, you could argue it may even increase based on historical data. It's conceivable. And actually, we see uh, violations of human rights every day all over the world, including in countries uh, saying that they are defending human rights. It's a continuous struggle. But the fact that something is <clears throat> not respected fully doesn't mean that it is not right to defend those uh, human rights. <clears throat> so, of course, the, the fact that people are, are, in a way, hypocrites or not practicing what the ideals say that they should practice doesn't mean that the, that the ideals are baseless. And, for example, if we should accept this uh, <coughs> ultra-democratic position that the majority can decide, okay, we now would like to torture suspects in the war on terror, or we should cut off the hand of thieves, then we are free to outvote Islam in Norway. And believe me, that is not impossible. We have strong parties, groups, advocating, prohibiting Islam in Norway. And if you say it's a democratic right, goodbye. Why is it wrong? Because you have human rights. Because Muslims have the right to practice their religion in the country where the majority is opposed to it. And if you don't stand up for that right when it comes to others, not to be mistreated, not to have their religion banned, etc. Why should we accept your right to be practicing Muslims in Norway against the will of the majority? If you don't understand that a modern democracy is not the rule of the majority or a majority tyranny, but it is always a tempered democracy, it's a democracy with respect for the individual and groups of individuals who want to live their lives the way they see fit, which is what I emphasized in my introductory remarks. We are talking about the right of individuals coming together in groups, in congregations, in mosques, to live their lives as they want to do it, even if it provokes me, even if I don't like it. What should I do? I should defend the right to do this while I at the same time use my freedom of expression to critique religion, to critique these practices as I have done today. But if someone comes here and tries to take those rights away from you, I will stand up and defend your right to be Muslims the way you want to be Muslims. Thank you, Dr. Gula. That's the conclude. Can I just add, because I have also a book, it's actually my doctoral dissertation, a little bit thicker than <coughs> Mr. Hijab's book. But this is actually an attempt to not prove, because I don't think that is possible, but an attempt to logically justify human rights. And I think it is a fairly valid a proposition that I'm making, so I will give this one to Mr. Hijab. It's good to see that love is in there. <laughs> MashaAllah. So that concludes our second, this is actually the third session, yeah? First one was the introduction, second one was the rebuttals, and this one was the interrogations. So now is the last and final session where the audience will have the opportunity to ask the respective questions to each speaker at a time. 
So first question will be to Muhammad Hijab. Do we have any questions from to Muhammad Hijab from the gents side or from the women's area? Any questions? No questions? Everything made sense? He won the debate? It's over and done? No? Okay. Uh, any questions? You may also send your questions by message to our Facebook page, the IslamNet Facebook page. If you wish, you could send your question to the Facebook page. But preferably, we have the microphones available and you will be given priority if you step forward to the microphones. Yeah, yeah, sure. Any questions for Muhammad Hijab? No questions? Yes, yes. Okay. Come to the microphone. You may choose any microphone you wish. I just have, thank you. I just have one question about what you mentioned about uh, uh, one old practice about cutting the hand with your teeth. Yeah. Um, wouldn't you think that that person would be labeled and recognized by everybody in the society the rest of their lives that they maybe once was a thief? Isn't that very cruel thing that you never are uh, ready with your punishment? Don't you think it's cruel? I think it is um, definitely it's, it's not nice to watch. Seeing, uh, but that's the whole point. Some things need to be cruel. You need to be cruel to be fair sometimes. The, the point is this, is that first and foremost, is it always applicable? I think that's the first question. I it's not always applicable that someone has to have their ampute hand amputated. But I think the system of ethics of Islam is different to the system of ethics of liberalism. So liberalism assumes that we own our bodies. And by the way, that's, a, that's another thing you cannot prove. By the way, you cannot prove logically or metaphysically that you own your own body. You cannot prove that. It's impossible to prove on first principles. Uh, let alone your children, which uh, some have, have stated actually in the literature. However, when we say this, that there are some deterrents which are... For example, cutting the hand of the thief and so on, which can apply sometimes in certain situations. We're admitting that this is something which is not. And the Quran actually says, when it talks about the had al zina, it says, In chapter 24, verse number two, it says, When you're applying the punishment, don't have compassion in your heart when you're applying the punishment, meaning, there is a natural inclination to feel like this is a bit, this is a bit much, it's a bit, you know. However, Allah is saying despite this, carry out the punishment. And the reason why is because it has a deterrent effect. Now, if you look at, for example, the death penalty in states where it's actually implemented in the United States, for example, and compare it to states where there, has, there is not implementation of it, murder rates are much higher in states which don't implement the death penalty. That's a fact. Reoffending rates in the UK, about 30% of people reoffend. Burglars reoffend, 30%. That's one in three people in prison, I've got to come out and do it again. So the whole point of, well, cutting the hand off, it reduces reoffending rate. It's very effective. It's scary, especially if people are watching it. This instills fear in the people's minds. We have a problem in, uh, in, in London. People are being stabbed. You know, we have 30,000 stabbings a year. And because the gang members that are stabbing, they don't, they don't care about the risk of going to prison. That's the bottom line. The fear is not there in their hearts. If you don't have fear for authority, like Emil Durkheim would say, then you can do whatever you want. So the point is, it has an, it has an intentional um, deterrent effect. Now, arguing, as Lars Schule has said, going against human rights are wrong because you have human rights. That is a circular argument. That's exactly what he said. He said, it's wrong, because you have, it's, it's wrong to go against human rights because you have human rights. But how do you prove you have human rights? The way you've described them. This is the problem in this debate, that you cannot prove your first premises. Therefore, there's no way of disproving this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. We have one question to Dr. Gula. <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, you believe in uh, the human rights. So I will just summarize what I understood. You mentioned that you believe in human rights and that if there was a referendum to vote that Muslims should be deported, that would be wrong because of the human rights. But if there was a referendum in terms of deciding these human rights, that it is okay 
to discriminate against religion. What would you then do? Because what are your human rights based upon? At the end of the day, it's a, there are human beings that came together and decided or voted or majority, minority, whatever, in they, 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 they agree that these are the human rights. How would you answer this question? Reality is reality. If the majority decides to throw Muslims out of Norway, <clears throat> they say we have a right to do so, and they change the laws, well, Muslims could try to bring the case in for the human rights uh, court in uh, Strasbourg, but if the majority had already decided, it wouldn't mean anything. That is the whole point of human rights. They are only respected as long as we recognize them as important and valuable. That's why it's a daily struggle. Germany was a very democratic state in the late 20s and early 30s. And it ended up with uh, Hitler and the abolition of democracy, the abolition of all sorts of liberal values, <clears throat> and ended up with, uh, with the Holocaust, a genocide. And that is why there are no guarantees. <laughs> and I mean, you know, okay, we replace this with uh, God and the will of God. So what guarantee do you have for anything then? Just a short comment. I, I think you may have misunderstood the question. Okay. Because from what I understood, he's asking that who are those who actually decide which human rights or what are the human rights? Who have the right to decide or define that these are... Because you keep ask, oh, okay. referring back to human rights. But these human rights are not God-given. So who is the one who... Where, where do they come from? The, it's, it's, it's that is a very good question. And the answer is that human rights are actually <clears throat> in continuous development. We've had some basic human rights understanding of what human rights should be, but it has varied over time. They have developed. One example is <clears throat> gender equality. When, <clears throat> they, when uh, the Declaration of Human Rights was accepted in 1948, it doesn't say one thing about uh, sexual minorities. Today, it is human rights law, at least in Europe, that sexual minorities, homosexuals, have equal rights, should not be discriminated because of their uh, sexual proclivities. We have seen that even though the Declaration and later on the conventions, legally binding conventions, were meant to give <coughs> respect to women, it wasn't followed up in practice. Therefore, we deepened the rights of women in a particular convention, and so on. We have now the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Who thought about children in 1948, in 1966? So this is a continuous development where everyone can have their say. Time is in the public debate. Thank you, Dr. Gula. And we have a question for uh, Mohammed Hijab uh, from the microphone, right? Yeah, I was just wondering um, uh, why should we prove things from first principles and um, how can you decide that the, the, the accepted method for proving things is the first principle, from the first principles? Thank you. Why should we prove things from first principles? There's more than one way of proving things. From first principles is one of the ways you can prove things from a logical perspective. There are other ways, from induction, from abduction, from some kind of deduction, which sometimes relies on some kind of induction or abduction. There are different ways of proving things in the world. That's why the scientific method works. And by the way, we're, we don't, we're not against the scientific method. In fact, we invented the scientific method. Muslims invented the scientific method. So the point of there being a contradiction between Islam and, and the scientific method is something I didn't uh, respond to. However, we know from the philosophy of science that science is not incorrigible. So it's something which is subject to change. And in fact, Karl Popper said that this was the thing that made science what it is, this falsifiability in his words. Having said all of this, to answer your question, we don't need to prove it from first principles, but what I was trying to do with my esteemed interlocutor today was let him use the same standards as he was using with us when we were having to prove God's existence, which is 
metaphysical, right? Because God, we wouldn't say he's physically uh, dwelling in the sense that he can be detected by uh, a microscope or some telescope or something. He asked us for evidence in that respect. So I wanted to ask him for evidence using his very methods of inquiring truth. And what he admitted today was that there's a difference between fact and normativity. Normativity means how something has become part of the discourse of, let's say, normality. Yeah. So that's, of course, I agree with this. Fact and normativity are two different separate things. It doesn't have to be uh, separate and it doesn't have to be um, disjunct. However, what I will say is, if you're going to make a case and tell us to be something, whether it's believing human rights, the 30 articles, which as the questioner was quite right in pointing out, was a collection of people that came in the UN Convention 1948 and decided on what 30, what 30 points should be the human rights. And that this, in his words, is correct. It's a development, meaning it keeps changing your mind. What he means by development is social forces are continually coming back and asking questions. Whoever has the loudest voice wins at the end. One of the human rights is not your right to tri tribal li lineage. It's, because tribalism is not part of the Western orient uh, sorry, the Western uh, post-colonial narrative. So it's usually what happens in the West will trickle down to the rest of the world. What's important in the West, and that's another issue with human rights. There are many issues with human rights. They focus too much on rights, what you're owed, and not enough on duties, what you owe. That's why you don't have any mother's rights in, in the 30 conventions. Of all the things you've been mentioning, the, your right to be good to your parents is not one of the rights. Is it, can you imagine? So the, the point I'm making to you is, you can't, you can't tell us to believe in something which in your own admission is not provable, it's not static, it's not incorrigible, and is fluid and subjective. That's unfair. I believe that's, that's unscientific as well. Thank you. Mohammed Hijab, I will take one question here from to Dr. Laj. The question is about uh, the doctor mentioning that we have to evolve in our, in our understanding of human rights. So, 50 years ago, homosexuality was not acceptable in accordance to human rights. Now, today, we do accept homose homosexuality in a Western liberal society. But some people are now arguing also that we should accept incest between brothers and sisters who willingly participate in that kind of relationship if there are prevention, etc. And some people are also arguing that we should accept uh, or make it illegal to have sexual intercourse with the animals, as actually has been practiced in Denmark for years. Uh, that it was, uh, it was actually in the news as well that people from Norway, they take sexual vacations to Denmark to have sexual intercourse with animals. So people today are arguing something and in the future they might argue different things. So how do we reconcile that, or should we just go along with whatever we now feel is morally correct? How do we define these boundaries? Where are the boundaries of moral, morally correct? Why is it, for example, not okay to have, uh, to have, uh, what, what is this called? Yes, for example, mild uh, pedophilia that you, for example, a man masturbates to a baby, a baby wouldn't take any harm of that from your values. What you should not do, and which is unacceptable, is that which harms someone else. Incest <clears throat> is usually understand, understood as the, a sexu sexual violation of the rights of a child. If you're talking about grown-ups, who cares? I don't. This is really a minority question. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there are instances of uh, sexual intercourse between consenting adults resulting in children. And the biological argument that this is harmful to the baby has a very weak foundation. Actually, it's more of a problem that cousins marry again and again and again. Because that limits the genetic pool that a brother and sister on one occasion marries and have a child. It's not a big genetic problem. Do I like it? Would I say, hooray, this is great? No. Why not? Have to. Why not? Why should I? I mean, I, wouldn't I, you do the same for the, the homosexuals? 
I, I right I'm to not, practice? I, I am not gay, and uh, why, why should I, why should I say? Because I accept the right of gays to be gay, and practice their, with consent, consenting adults, their sexual proclivities. It does. It doesn't mean that I have given an invitation. I mean, uh, the, the, why, why should why should you think so? I am saying that I have my preferences. Maybe I like blondes. Maybe I like colored women. That's a preference. It doesn't mean that I have to say that, oh, it's not all right to do it otherwise. I mean, you have to think through. And your initial reaction that I don't like this, this is disgusting. Uh, well, it's disgusting with amputation, and that's actually a more serious case than having sex voluntarily with another person of the same gender, actually. So here we have cultural ideas, and that is the important point. How do these things change? They change because we recognize greater and greater freedom for the individual as long as the activities of the individual does not harm physically or psychologically other people. You say the same about animals? Was that, uh, was that the same answer for two well, people? Well, <laughs> I mean, as long as you're not hurting the animal. I am also in favor of animal rights. <clears throat> and again, I mean, uh, uh, excuse me for going over time, but since you are adding to the question here, the, 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 the question here <clears throat> has, to, it, I mean, you can argue based on principle, but you can also argue, as Mr. Hijab has done, based on empirical realities. And then the question becomes, how how many people does this involve? What is the problem here? How large is the problem? Why should we have laws against something that, I mean, a very small minority, and I would like to see the statistics on how many Norwegians are traveling to Denmark to have sex with animals. And what animals, by the way? I mean, this becomes sort of absurd discussion. Thank you. So I will take one question to Mohammed Hijab. This actually, it feels like it's a follow-up question. Um, the individual is asking, how does Islam uh, regard these kinds of matters, uh, sexual relationships with uh, the same gender and with uh, animals, and uh, why do you believe that, that, that your moral views are correct? First of all, I find it quite interesting that you find amputation of hands disgusting, but when we're talking about having sex with dogs and cats and horses, this is not something that maybe makes you feel disgusted. And frankly, this shows you how much liberalism and human rights are creatures of convention. They are subjective. They are baseless. They're just basically what white people, sorry to say, what white people find okay, what white people find tasty, what for, what, the sensibilities of the white people. That's what, li literally, sorry to say, that is liberalism in a nutshell. Sense White man's, not even woman for the, for the most part, white man's sensibilities, subjective um, preferences. Yeah, it's okay for a brother and sister to have sex, but cutting the hand of the thief, uh, no, 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 that, that's, come on, man. I mean, who, who's, who's made this the uh, parameters, the correct parameters? For us, it's, it's, a, it's a straightforward um, thing. And when I say white man, I'm not meaning that derogatorily, I'm meaning that quite physically, in the sense that the 1948 Convention of Human Rights the ones who had the, the biggest say in that were American white men because America emerged as a superpower and it was in charge of those particular institutions and still is, disproportionately considering the size of China and Russia, by the way. And there's lots of literature in that. And I'm sure he's aware of it. So when we say the New World Order and the white man is in control of the, um, basically the preferences that we, the rest of the world, we should be shaped in the image and the mold of the white man post-enlightenment experience. This is the reality. So you can have sex with a dog, potentially, right? He didn't want to really say it. You can have sex with your mum and your dad. Sorry, children are here. Or your brother or your sister. You can have, enjoy your time, freedom. But, you know, this thing about cutting the hand, I don't know about that, it's disgusting. Oh, who's giving us the... I mean, to be honest, it's like, I eat this, I, I drink that. 
It's all a matter of taste now. It's become a bit ridiculous. You can't force your taste on me. I like Somali food. You might like Viking food. <laughs> you might like Norwegian. I don't know what they eat here. You can't tell me you have to eat the sausage and this egg and... No, come on. I don't find that nice. We say the murajjah, or the one who finally determines which is acceptable moral recourse and what is not acceptable to answer the question. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is God Almighty? And we have good reason to believe God exists. God exists. We have good reason to believe the Prophet Muhammad is, is the actual final Prophet. He gives evidences for that. And so divine command theory would suggest that whatever comes from this is eternally true, which, by the way, can adjust in terms of time and place, but that's part of the eternally true mechanism. And that's how we live our lives, sexual matters, financial matters, and so on and so forth. Like I said, if you want guidance, you have to seek guidance from the one who knows all guidance, which we believe is God. Thank you. I believe you have a question from the microphone to Dr. Gula. Yes. Okay, Dr. Gula, I have many questions, actually. I'll just make it short. Uh, first of all, question one, is liber liberalism changing with time? I think you've kind of answered it, but I want to have a fully answer because for the past 400 years, today and then another 400 years from now, there's going to come another person like you who's going to say different things. So is it changing? Another, atheism. Isn't that a form of belief as well? You have some form of text or belief that you're holding on to. Third, oh, which country... We can't take too many questions because oh. you only have three minutes to answer. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll make it short then. You talk about homosexuality uh, when it comes to human anatomy. Human anatomy is not created the way the homosexuals thinks. I work as a doctor and I see more cases uh, related to homosexuality diseases than cousin and uh, cousin and a man and woman who are married who come there for that reasons. The human anatomy is not created the way the homosexuality works. No matter how you're trying to define it, change and you're trying to make the human rights that they deserve the human rights, their anatomy is not made the correct way. So evolution, no matter how much evolution you put into it, it's not going to change. So in, in terms of you talk about uh, being good in the society and making the society well, good for the people, you're making everything wrong for the, 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 the kids who are coming after us. They're going to have more diseases because of homosexuality. I've never seen any diseases where cousins and, uh, were married and they come because of, uh, they have an intercourse or any other reasons. There are more diseases related to homosexuality. How can we change that with time? Can you answer? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Dr. Lash, you have yes, three minutes. Liberalism is in continuous development and I really hope that someone will come with uh, good answers in 400 years that differs from mine today. If not, then the world had stagnated. So of course, that is the whole point. Liberalism or the defense of human rights, political philosophy develops over time because it's a continuous dialogue with history and the current situation. That is why philosophy is a continuous process, especially when we are talking about morality, ethics, and political organization. The future will be so different that to say now what it should be like in 200 and 400 years is absurd. That's preposterous. That, that would be like taking the position of God. And besides, we have agreed here that Islam and Islamic interpretations also change over time. Atheism is not a life stance, not a religion in itself. It is a position on certain aspects of reality. You can have good arguments, you can have poor arguments for atheism. Uh, there are many of them around. Um, my position is that I cannot find, contrary to Mr. Hijab, good reasons for believing in God. I find all those stories contradictory, self-contradictory. They don't make sense to me. I recognize that it makes sense to others. So, Faddal, you can believe whatever you want. Of course, you have the right to believe what you want. Homosexuality, well, if doctors, if medical science now and in the future discovers problems with it, well, Again, we, have, we are allowed to do a lot of things with our bodies that some find stupid, disgusting. Piercing, for example. Tattooing. Oof, I don't like it. Terrible. 
Women with holes in their ears and rings and so on. What's the point? I, I don't like it. But it's their right. So if consenting adults have sex with each other, the same gender, it's up to them. And no one should, I, I mean, I, here it is interesting because the norms of privacy in Islam are actually very interesting. What happens behind the closed door is nobody's business. So you could have sex with one of the same kind. It, it's nobody's business. Well, to say that it harms the people is a position, and that is an empirical statement, and that is something that can be investigated empirically by the science of medicine. And I say, if you have suggestions that it is harmful, then you can give, give advice to those who practice homosexuality and say you should do it that way or not at all. But it's their business in the end. Thank you. Piercing is also harmful, in my opinion. Thank you. So uh, we will take one question to Mohammed Ijab that is actually very, very relevant now that you keep basing your, your arguments upon or bringing them back to the existence of God. How can you actually prove that God exists? Where's the book? <laughs> this has got the, um, some of the proofs, the medieval proofs, which are, for example, the argument for contingency, the Kalam cosmological argument, the find. Actually, I don't spend much time. This is called Kalam Cosmological Arguments, the book. So it spends more time on Kalam Cosmological Arguments. So if you want to really know the answer to this question, I'm not going to give you justice in three minutes. That, that requires a long time so you can get the book. But I just wanted to comment on a few things. Um, the gentleman asked a very good question. He said, 400 years, someone else might come and say something different. And he admitted, yeah, he said, hopefully that happens. The, the thing is, if the white man has the hegemony on Hollywood and, um, and, and political hegemony, then really it will be white people dictating how the rest of us should live our lives and telling us these are the correct kind of rights and these are not the correct kind of rights. The truth is they have not done a referendum on the rest of the world. They haven't gone to the African villages and asked them what morality do you accept? What morality do you believe is true? And then predicated human rights based on this kind of moral consensus of, for example, so-called so developing world peoples, oriental peoples and so on. So, Really what it's been in the post-colonial world, especially after 1945, World War II, it has been a, a, an agreement among whites. And that's what we've had to be forced to, to kind of believe in. Or the discourse has been, has been parameterized to, to that particular narrative. It's our, these are the rights which we consider the most important. God is not part of that. It's a secular discourse. And therefore, you have to believe in it. So 400 years... Maybe nowadays you might find burkas not nice and bikinis are nice, but maybe 400 years you might like burki, uh, burkinis. I don't know. It might be a white man. But basically, whatever tickles the white man's fan fancy. This is the problem. Homosexuality uh, is another thing. He talked about homosexuality and bestiality and so on. The problem is, he said, well, you'd have to see if the dog or whatever animal it is, I'm not sure if he said dog, um, is harmed or not. But how can a dog consent when they can't even speak? Has he been a bark? How, 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 how's he going to say? How you, how, seriously, I, I want to have sex with you, dog. How, how? Two dogs for yes and one, one bark for it. How are you going to know? I mean, this, this, is the re, this is the absurdity of consent theory and liberalism. You know, seriously, I mean, where do we draw the line? Um, you said stories contradict themselves. Uh, that's problematic because you said the stories of the Quran contradict itself or in religion. But in your last debate, our two... Minute 23, I said, you said, I don't spend much time reading the Qur'an, why should I? This is what you said. So how do you know that the Torah contradicts yourself if you're not even reading the Qur'an properly? And moreover now, you're enduring contradictions when it comes to human rights. You endure the contradiction of pluralism versus secularity, pluralism versus democracy, individual freedoms versus collective freedoms. You're enduring those contradictions and you're acknowledging those endurations and therefore you shouldn't really be sanctimonious in your presentation. Thank you. You were referring to me or to the one who asked the question? No, I was referring to you. Yeah, well, yeah. I have not talked about the Quran today, no, reading no, or previous, not reading the Quran. Previous debate so, uh, with Hamza Zosis. Hour 2, minute 23. I, I just, uh, I, I like to be particular about those. You said I don't spend much time reading the Quran. 
So, I, no, I, I don't think I've mentioned the Quran at all. Well, we can go and find out. <coughs> yeah. I'll give I, you the time I, stamp. I said that story is about God. Uh, I find okay, uh, contradictory. Right. Oh, okay, uh, okay. And that goes for the Christian God and Hindu gods oh, right. and so on and so forth. I, oh, okay. I don't find them convincing. Okay. Um, yeah. So. No problem. So we have a question to Dr. Lash from the other side. Uh, I will ask uh, Lars Gulle about one thing. Uh, he said that uh, cutting on the hand of uh, a thief is uh, cruel. Yeah, it is uh, cruel. But uh, one thing, if, uh, let us say that I am going in a, in a television store now, and I am stealing from somebody who had, who had been working for getting a television store all their life, is it then good that uh, I have two hands and can go and steal another place? I, I'm not sure that I understood the question. Is it good if I go to another television store after I try to steal from a television store a television from a man who has been working all his life? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. That that is the that is the individual individual prevention, and in a quite physical way, you try to. Uh, prevent the thief from stealing again by making it physically impossible for for him well you have arguments for that you have had arguments for that in the in the West <coughs> in Europe uh, that we need to be strict we had torture of traitors of thieves we had the burning of witches etc etc to scare people all of this was Cruel and inhumane. Part of the problem is that you even can convict people, execute people, for wrong reasons. They actually turn out to be innocent. The whole idea of modern penology, the theories of punishment, is that we rehabilitate the criminal. We condemn and punish the crime and we rehabilitate the criminal. And when we're talking about the prevalence of uh, crime in the UK and in the States, as Mr. Hijab uh, referred to, I could inform him that the Norwegian system, far from being perfect, it is considered by many too lenient, but we have probably the lowest recurrence rate in the world when it comes to uh, re-offending. So actually a humane system of punishment and rehabilitation is better when it comes to reducing crime than those with serious, uh, with serious uh, uh, punishments. And you have the story from the Sudan when, uh, uh, when the, the uh, Islamic Front uh, introduced the Sharia after military coups there, they started with the, the Hadood punishments. And the story is that when they were chopping off the hands of thieves in public with huge crowds, the pickpockets had a field day. So much for prevention. Thank you. Do we have a question to Mr. Hijab? Yes, we have a question. No? Do we have a question for Mohammed Hijab? Yes, we have a question to Mohammed Hijab. May you come forward to the microphone, please? Uh, I would like to ask uh, Hijab uh, about uh, objective morality. Uh, oh, sorry, I can see. Yeah. Uh, someone uh, like we would say today that uh, objective morality says that uh, incest uh, is wrong, absolutely wrong, yeah? And someone can, could argue like uh, it, it wasn't uh, like that all the time, uh, you know? There was a time uh, when Adam and Eve, you know, uh, the incest was allowed. So how can we answer that question? Great, Great question. Um, let me answer that question and then move on to something. I just wanted to make a point on some of the comments that were made. So we believe in Sharia consequentialism. Yeah, so something which is halal in one place can be haram in another. And the Quran says, 
So, for example, if you have to eat pork in a certain time period, if you're if you're if you're forced to it, you can do it. So this is uh, where usul comes in. Actually, they take these principles to do usul. So if you're like Imam Shafi'i said, "Ida daq al amr tasaat al sharia, wa the tasaat al sharia daq al amr." If the situation becomes more constricted, the sharia becomes more flexible, and if the sharia becomes more flexible, the situation becomes more constricted. Therefore, yes, there there can be things which are completely haram, like even saying kalimat kufr, saying words of kufr. Forget about. Uh, Adam and Eve's children having uh, intercourse, which we, we, we don't have a problem with in that context. The same thing, we don't have a problem with someone making kalimat uh, kufr in that context, because they're muttar. So where is darura? Ad-darura tubiha al-mahdurat, as the qaida of the, or the principle of usul says. If there's, if, there's a, if there's a need for it, and there's absolute necessity for the continuation of human race, then that becomes permissible, and it's a different context altogether. So this idea of a rigid Islam, I totally agree with uh, Lash Goulet. People who believe in that kind of rigid Islam will be able, will find it very difficult to navigate themselves in the modern world. Just to mention a point now, because I have some time, on barbarity or cruelty equals falsity, which is again, uh, cr uh, cutting the hand of the thief is cruel, is an emotional argument. That's what that is. I can make an emotional argument as well, I'll show you. For example, in Islam we believe in qisas. Yeah, so we believe that some uh, 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 eye for an eye, and an eye for an eye doesn't make the whole world go blind. It makes it monocular because if someone has one eye, you'll see the, the other eye left. His idea is false, actually false reasoning, uh, bad uh, logic. But the point is, if you have a small daughter, I'll make an emotional argument. Yeah, you have a young daughter, three years old, a bad man in East London, where I'm not based, but I'm based in London. Walking around, they throw acid around, like you know, proper acid. Yeah. If you have a young daughter and someone throws acid on her, that person gets a suspended sentence of five years, six years in prison. Ten years. Do you think that's fair? I think majority of people from an emotional perspective will say no. And this is, a, this is an emotional argument. Say, actually, the father should take acid and put it on that man as well. Let him live with the consequences similar to that which he inflicted on someone else. And a lot of people emotionally will accept that kind of argument. If you ask me to prove it on first principles, I won't be able to. I can prove it on divine command theory, but I can't prove it on first principles. That's the point I'm making. It's subjective unless you have some kind of anchorage, and that is the point I'm making. If you want to make emotional arguments, I can make emotional arguments all day, make you all angry, talk about pedophilia, raping babies, and so on. They should be killed, and most of you will agree with me. But what I'm saying is, we can't prove those things from first principles unless you have moral objective anchorage. Thank you. We have a question to Dr. Lash. The sister is wearing a niqab and she's mentioning that uh, Dr. Lash, he claims to be defending the human rights and in the, in, in the specific articles of, of human rights, it is constituted that everyone has the right to education, but Dr. Lash, he feels disgusted that uh, she is wearing a hijab, or, or, or sorry, a niqab, and he would not uh, support her right to education. That's a summarized version of it in English. Uh, I, I'm not uh, disgusted by much, uh, not uh, niqabs either, but the niqab prevents an open, free, and equal dialogue and communication. The right to education is not absolute. You need grades, you need to have qualified, and you need qualifications in order to enter higher education. So there is a meritocratic system here, where you have to have earned it through achieving competence, qualifications, not wanting to show your face to other people means that you have said no to a lot of things. I mentioned piercing earlier. If you are wearing a lot of piercing, including, or not even a lot of piercing, but including holes in your ears, you have to remove that if you are going to be a nurse or a doctor in the Norwegian healthcare system. Why? Not because it directly, immediately harms other people, because, but because there are good reasons, medical hygienic reasons for that. So if you are choosing the profession of medicine, you have to follow the rules of that profession. How to behave in a responsible hygienic manner. If you choose to enter an academic institution, you should abide by the rules of that institution and those rules are openness, equality, trust, etc. And when you hide your face behind a niqab 
behind big sunglasses or you wear a crash helmet with the visir down, you are saying, I don't want to talk to you on an equal footing. So next time, please address me on the phone. Thank you. Okay, so I've been informed that uh, the time for the question and answer session has been... Uh, is it, huh? You want to take one more question each? Okay, so let's take one more question each uh, by the request of the speakers. So, um, can we have a question for Mohammed Hijab? Do we have a question from the audience first and foremost? Yeah. Because he argued that uh, we don't need to liberalize Islam because uh, we don't have a proof that liberalism is true. But if we assume that liberalism is true, is there any part of Islam that need that need to be liberalized? Sorry, that last bit. Can you say that? If is there any part of Islam is that? Is there any part of Islam that need to be liberalized? If you. Be, be, what's the word you said? To summarize, if, if we assume the premise that liberalism is true, are there any parts of Islam that needs to be, liberal, to, needs to be liberalized? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, if liberalism is true, is that what she said? Yeah, well, obviously, if, if liberalism is true, everything needs to be liberalized, doesn't it? Because if, that's, that's the point, but we have to fi first find out what liberalism are we talking about? Are we talking about utilitarian liberalism, utilitarian consequentialist liberalism? Are we talking about a hedonistic one, a contractarian one, a non-contractarian one, one that's based on virtue ethic, ethics, um, a social liberalism, a political liberalism, a fiscal liberalism, um, whose conception of liberalism, what place, what time? So first we have to discuss which liberalism, and then we have to discuss if it was true, that's something else. Um, just, to, just to make a comment on the niqab issue, so just to finalize the question, if obviously if liberalism is true, then we'd have to liberalize everything. But the point is, that's not been proven today with the admission of my interlocutor, uh, to his credit. And now having said that, the, the point of niqab, I just wanted to mention that this was an interesting discussion because in Britain, I'm not sure in Norway, if you have any blind judges. Have you got any blind judges? In Britain, we had a blind judge in a place called Tower Hamlets in London, which means a judge who cannot see. And the, the main reason I see for those advocates against niqab is that they say, well, you can't see their facial expressions, right? So that blocks barriers to communication. But if that's the case, in the same way as you would need to ban a niqab in a public space, then you'd have to say to blind people that they shouldn't moderate certain things, including, of course, judiciary, because they wouldn't be able to see people's facial expressions. So all of their... Uh, carry all of their judgments are actually miscarriages of just justice if if seeing the face is so important You should ban blind people from being judges Because actually that would mean that everything that they're seeing is not the full picture And of course This is something you could have to be not only with the, the, the judiciary But in many other professions where it would be deemed of course that such facial expression is of paramount importance so the, the, the arguments will necessitate, if we're being consistent, and if we, from a liberal perspective, give equal privilege to religious discrimination vis-a-vis -vis, um, disability discrimination, then we would have to say that wherever there is a ban on niqab because of communication or the, the illa or the causative reasoning is communication problems, then there should be a ban on blind people being communicators, judges, or otherwise arbitrators in those settings as well. If you don't give those two things equal weightings and you give disabled people higher privilege, then that is arbitrary, and arbitrariness is against liberalism. And there's no reason for it. So I would suggest that Lars Gule, because he's an intelligent man and a man who I admire for his consistency on some stances, frankly, to revise his position on that based on his own principles, because I do think if he thinks about it from those angles, he may well change his position. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you. Did we start with the first question to Dr. Laj? Or to, Dr. Or to Mohammed? To Mohammed Hijab? Okay, so we have one last question for Dr. Kula. From the microphone, please. Uh, first, of, first of all, I just want to say to you, never say to a Muslim woman, call me on my phone because she's never going to do that. So you just have to know that especially if she's wearing niqab so that's hopeless yeah and my question is <laughs> uh, 
uh, I just got it in Norwegian. I will try to translate it in English, inshallah. So, how would you define the freedom of religion for children, like small kids? Because the parents, they just want to learn their children what they think is good for them, yeah? The same does Muslims as well. But in West, whatever the non-Muslims does, they, it's like, it's freedom. But if, like, here in Norway, we got, like, choosing a boyfriend or girlfriend or dancing in pairs and, yeah, and going to discos and such things. But if a Muslim fa uh, father or mother just uh, avoids uh, their children not to do such things, then their children are, are oppressed. So how would you define like the f freedom of uh, religion for children? Thank you. Thank you. It, it's an interesting and difficult question because uh, according to uh, international human rights law, the legally binding conventions, parents <clears throat> are the ones who are responsible for their children's religious upbringing. So they have a right to, uh, to um, impart their religious beliefs uh, to children. Uh, and I defend that right, because I cannot see anyone else who should do it. So this is a moral argument and not a legal argument. It is an it's an appeal, not only to Muslim parents, but to all parents, to give children freedom to explore, to investigate, to find out what they want to believe in. And one of the things that <coughs> parents should do is to give them that the freedom to opt out of the religion of parents by not telling them that if you change your religion, we're not going to talk to you anymore. Furthermore, parents should not make irrevers irreversible physical changes to their children as a mark of their religious belonging. Circumcision of men, boys, should stop if a man wants to be circumcised as a sign of his belonging to a given religion, he can do so after he has become mature, 18 years of age. And this goes, of course, for uh, female genital mutilation. Totally unacceptable in order to uh, make a religious cultural identity statement. Here, children should have freedom to decide if they want to cut off the whole thing after they are have become 18, but parents should not make that irreversible decision uh, for their children. And they should give them a liberal, meaning non-strict upbringing so that they can explore various life stances, religions, uh, etc. That's what I mean but, uh, about giving uh, freedom of religion to children. But, and, and this is because it is a responsibility to parents to, um, what is the, the good English word? They are forvalter, they are the keepers of their children's safety and moral upbringing, and that is a big responsibility, and it has to be uh, carried out in a very good way. So it's wrong, but if they learn like other things, you have to repeat. Yeah, so if the parents decide to learn their children Islam, so it's wrong, no. No, 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 no. I'm s well, there are different ways of teaching children religion. You can say, this is what we believe, but you are free to choose. Or you can say, this is what we believe, and this is what you are going to believe, and if you say otherwise, we are going to kill you. That's the difference. You see the point? Uh, sorry. You need to use a microphone. I don't know if it's the acoustics of this room or my age, but I simply cannot hear. Okay. Even you, if you, I've got a new hearing aid. The, the, you said that adults should do, that he should decide and do circumcision. Is that what you said, right? Again. Circumcision. Of yes. Planning. Yeah. That you said a person should be adult and then he should decide and then do it. Exactly. Have you ever seen an adult do circumcision? No. I've seen it. Do you know? <laughs> 
moment, moment. No, this, this is this is this is just general topic. Which prognosis would be bad? A, uh, a kid under five years old uh, performing circumcision, or a adult who is well developed, over eighteen having some circumcision? Who will have a bad prognosis? Any good surgeon who is performing will tell you an answer that. Uh, maybe you can tell me which one do you think yeah, is bad. Uh, that is irrelevant. The no, question here. The you qu can now make it clear. No, 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 no. A person should be adult and then make circumcision. No, yeah. from science, it's proven that a kid has a better prognosis and a better result of circumcision. I, so I don't no matter how, how much you say that this is a right of an adult, has nothing to do with adult. I but don't adult. care. The point here is. See, there you go. That's the point. No, I'm arguing you now, so you're wrong at that point. You understand? A, one, a better person can I'm come not, I'm not, and I'm not. I am, I'm not discussing medicine. I'm discussing right and wrong. You cannot make a claim like that. That's the problem. You cannot make a claim like that. Of if course I can. Claim, then you need to back it up with something. <laughs> what I'm saying is that if you circumcise a child, you have introduced that child to a certain culture and religion. No, without, me wait, let me speak. Without the consent of the child, that is taking away from the child a possibility to choose later on. If you, as an adult, decide to do something, and it is very scary because now, ooh, wow, this can have complications, that is your choice. But because it is more difficult when you are older, you cannot impose it on the child when the child cannot consent. But you understand the prognosis thing, though, no matter how you want to define it. I don't care. One second, one second, the, one second. The, one the second, prognosis second. is irrelevant because Dr. this is a moral question. Dr. It Lush. is not an empirical There's medical a question. For their child. One second, one second, one second. So what, just. Uh, Quick, quick. So if they do this in America for medical reasons, not being Muslims, then that would be okay? You would be okay with that? A child no, being circumcised no, for medical no, reasons, no, for medical benefits? No. Why not? The arguments for medical benefits What about are, taking drugs or medicines, etc.? The argument for... Or, or vaccines. Let me answer. Don't interrupt. The argument for medical uh, advantages of uh, child circumcision of, of babies or uh, children are weak and nevertheless they are irrelevant from a moral perspective because it is the person who has the right to decide on these things. We are talking about something that is irreversible. An injection, ox um, uh, vaccine and so on, they are not irreversible and parents usually, it goes with an operation. A child has an illness, they bring him to the hospital. Of course, then the parents decides, based on medical advice, on what is best for the child. He, he she needs an operation to get rid of the appendix that has become infected. That is not a problem. That is taking care of a life. That is saving life. That is protecting life. You are not protecting life by cutting off part of the uh, penis. Okay, let's stop the penis talk now and go on. <laughs> so uh, this went on uh, quite a bit long, and we are getting more requests that people want to ask their questions, and they're kind of really any. So we're going to give one more question here, and I have to take one more for Gula as well to make it fair. Uh, <coughs> this question goes to Brother Mohammed Hijab. Uh, I've understood that uh, liberalism, uh, w w we cannot prove liberalism, that's why we cannot f go further with this discussion about liberalism. But what about if we say, uh, can Islam or part of Islam be modernized? Uh, can we modernize Islam and did uh, Mu'tazila and uh, or philosophers, did they modernize Islam at that time, according to their time and age? Thank you. So theories of modernization usually revolve around post-enlightenment thought processes. And usually the dominant ethic being referred to either directly or indirectly is liberalism, democracy, uh, individualism and those things. That's, it's, it's usually a Eurocentric basically definition of modernization. Um, however, just to kind of point something out which is very important, two things actually which I've been hearing, I'm just trying to listen to the interchange between Dr. Goulet and the audience members. So the, the point of not introducing them to a certain culture and religion goes against human rights, actually, because one of the human rights 
is right to education. Point three says, parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their child. And this goes to the heart of a problem which we were facing in Birmingham in the United Kingdom, which is, do, does the school have the right to teach young children, for example, certain sexual things, or do the parents have the right? The, one of the best arguments from their own paradigm, and I'm saying from their own paradigm, to make it very clear, but we don't disagree with this, that a parent should have a right to, to give um, education to their child. Now, you can't limit the variables and say you can have a right to give education, but it can't be an Islamic one. Because that will go against the two points of liberalism, consent and reciprocity. It goes against this human right, actually. So from a human rights perspective, from a liberal perspective, you can't actually maintain that I'm allowed to teach my child to be an agnostic, atheist, liberal feminist, but this person from Somalia, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, he doesn't have their right to give them their moral and ethic. That's actually a kind of totalitarianism. Uh, it's, move, it's veering in the, in the direction of totalitarianism, which I'm sure he's against, but it's, it's quite odd that I heard that argument being made. Moreover, FGM is usually associated with the Middle East and Africa, but that's because there's been a problem. You mentioned with the FGM. FGM is practiced most by Western women because the way that the WHO defines FGM includes things like piercings, which we know now, Dr. Goulet is against, in the vagina, and labiaplasty, which are construction surgeries to basically, sorry to be explicit, thin the lips of the vagina for a woman, which is usually done for cosmetic reasons. The NHS, which is the National Health Service in the UK, actually gives guidance to women on how to do this. So the point is, there is, and this is becoming quite prominent in the literature now, FGM, depending on how you actually define it, could be said to be an epidemic in the Western world. But it's always looking at the Muslims or the Arabs or the Africans with a view to make them a subject of investigation and peculiarity that makes them um, an orientalist point for liberal critique, which I think is hypocritical in all its forms. Thank you. We will take the last question to Dr. Guler. Is there anyone? Okay, wait, let me see. There are too many hands, subhanAllah. Did, now this will be the last one, unfortunately. I have a question for Lash uh, Gula. Uh, I find it a bit problematic when you say, uh, as I remember you say, uh, human rights is human rights, it's not mother definition. But uh, in social science, as we learn, the definition is one, uh, the most important thing when you want to have a good theory. And if you say in the uh, social science from uh, Karl Marx and uh, Max Weber, to, did, to this day with the Bourdieu, all they have tried to do is redefinition the uh, culture, for example. So I, feel, uh, I find it a bit problematic when you say we don't need to defi uh, the definition uh, the human rights. But I can understand you if you say it's a, a priori. But then you say later that in the 70s uh, that uh, uh, sexual rights wasn't there and that uh, human rights will develop. And that goes against a priori as we know that Kant, when he said that a priori have some principles and that is, is, it cannot change over time. So if human rights is not a priori, so how can you uh, argument for human rights with a definition, please? Thank you. I, of course, you have to define human rights. I, what I have said is that you cannot prove them. You cannot give a, a, a scientific proof of human rights. You can argue to justify them. But of course, you have to define them. And you can basically say that we have three major human rights. It's the right to life, the, the uh, right to liberty, and the right to uh, welfare, well-being. And what we find in the different conventions are um, concretizations of those three major types of, uh, of human rights. Now, th that is by itself a, a, a definition of them. Uh, uh, and they are sometimes legally binding and then you can extend them and give them moral value and so on and they change uh, as I said because you can expand them and uh, give more rights uh, emphasize certain rights and so on 
so I'm not against the, uh, attempting to define in a serious and meaningful way human rights, on the contrary. But I am saying that you cannot give a mathematical proof. You can give good justifications for human rights. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. We will have to. Because uh, I used the word definition, but I meant proof. Because if you say, like, when in the social science, when you don't prove a thing, you put it in the a priori category. But as you say in the principles, the human rights, uh, when you as you talk about them, they don't uh, fit with the principles of a priori. So even uh, Foucault with the postmodernism. They have some principles, so I, I'm looking to understand because I want to understand. I want to understand how I can prove human rights and fight for human rights with reason. So, so if I cannot put it in the a priori category and I have no principles of, as the postmodernist, so how can I find principles to understand? Because I have to understand as a human being, as okay. a rational human being. Thank you. You, ha- you have one minute to answer that question. Yeah, so it's well, the same uh, question. Th- there are elements of a prioriness here. When we're talking about human worth and human dignity as the base, well, human worth and human dignity is what is protected by human rights. Human rights is a consequence of human beings having human worth and human dignity. And that is a metaphysical position. I agree. It is something that you can argue uh, for. You can try to give it it some sort of empirical reference by saying that social reality is normative. We are all living in a world where we are following rules. And we do so instinctively, actually. So in that sense, there is a, a, a certain a prioriness and also actually an empirical reference uh, here, but it is. Uh, but I would not claim to prove human rights. Uh, I, I wouldn't. Uh, this is an ongoing philosophical uh, discussion, where human rights have good um, arguments based on many different positions. Something I will come back to in uh, the summation. Thank you. So we will end the question and answer session with that. And uh, Dr. Lash, you will have five minutes to give your final remarks. And uh, Mohammed Hijab, you will have also five minutes to give your final remarks. Then I will conclude the session. And after that, everyone stay seated. We have a big surprise. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Oh, Okay. First of all, we are not talking about um, taste when we are talking about cruelty. We are talking about uh, not our subjective uh, experience of uh, taste. We are talking about something that has to do with right and wrong. We are not talking about false or true. False and true relates to the empirical world. It is true that the earth revolves around the sun. It is not right or wrong. It's not right or wrong. Right or wrong relates to, it's not true to say that it is wrong to kill someone. That's not true. It is wrong to kill someone. The fact that the world is divided into different spheres and where we have an empirical sphere describing reality, telling us how things are, is different from morality, law, and politics, where we are talking about how things should be. That is something that has to do with with norms. Norms is something that we can discuss. Human rights are norms. They also represent values. Those values are important because they are there to defend, to protect human worth and human dignity. And therefore, human rights have good reasons. They have been given by theologians, Muslim theologians, Christian theologians. They have been given by philosophers. They have been given by legal scholars, political scientists, politicians. Have all given good reasons for human rights. And those reasons have been accepted. They have been accepted by a majority of representatives of the people of the earth. It is not true when Mr. Hijab says that they were a Western invention. They have a long history 
in the West, but just as little as there is a Western mathematics, Western natural science, Western physics, Western chemistry. There are no Western human rights. They are universal. When they were developed in order to be put on paper, made into a declaration, that was an intercultural process where representatives of the Muslim world, of the Confucian world, of the atheist world, as well as the Christian world, took part. There was an argument. We need God here. We need God to guarantee human dignity and human worth. And then you would think it was the atheist communist who said, no, we don't go for God. But it wasn't. It was the Confucians, the Chinese. They said, we are Confucians. We don't believe in God. And then the committee who drafted the Human Rights Declaration realized that we can agree on the human rights, but we don't have to agree on the reason, our own justification for human rights. Therefore, you can have your Islamic justification for human rights, as many Muslims, scholars, legal scholars, philosophers have. Or you can have my rationalist uh, arguments in favor. You can have Christian arguments. You can have Hindu and Buddhist arguments. Human rights are not carved in stone. They are developing as we use our reason in order to understand and improve the world we are living in, in order to prove, improve the protection of each and every one of us. And so far, they have done a good job. It does not mean that they are being respected universally, even though they are universally applicable, even though they have universal pretensions, they are not respected universally. That's why fighting for human rights, including freedom of expression and the right to blaspheme, including freedom of religion, also the right to change your religion. And I'm not sure that Mr. Hijab knows, but in the dialogue between Christians and Muslims in Norway, it was actually agreed that the right to change your religion is a basic human rights which should be respected by Muslims without repercussions for uh, uh, members of congregations, mosques, or families who change their uh, re religion. A final point. Education has to do with becoming a good citizen, a functioning citizen. That's why, in general, parents can take care of that right, but sometimes they don't do it in a good way. That's why we have child services, Barna Varna. That's why we can also make demands on the content of education for children so that they will function in a good way in a democratic society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lars, for your final remarks. So I would request uh, Mohammed Hijab to give his final remarks as well. Well, just to comment on some of the things that were said in the final part of that summary, that it was an intercultural process, deciding human rights was an intercultural process. It was an intercultural process to some degree, but one that the Western elites presided over, especially after World War II. This is well-known history. I mean, there was a bipolar system uh, of international relations uh, where the Soviet Union and America became the two dominant forces. And of course, America, controlled the international organizations, including, of course, the UN. Of course, he was talking about Chinese. Uh, he referred to them as the confusion world. I would put to him that probably the liberal world is the one that's confused. But Chinese have a whole different set of moral uh, injunctions. If you go to South China, sometimes you'll, you might see somewhat a restaurant uh, of people eating uh, dogs, for example. Although, albeit, I mean, they're not making arguments to have sex with them is still completely different in terms of the prioritization of rights. And we don't see the world shape, shaped in Chinese or Russian uh, rights images. My opponent today has been asked three questions to prove 
liberalism slash human rights, to prove the presuppositions of those things, including freedom, equality, etc. And then also to concede or admit that within liberal systems you can have punitive laws, corporal punishments, racism, colonialism, etc. And to my surprise, he actually agrees with me on all three of those points, which is, I think, a very good way to end the debate where the two people agree on some of the main issues in regards to moral theory. So I want to thank my opponent for coming today and putting up with my hostile approach to debating, which has become a hallmark of my, um, <laughs> my interchanges with people. And I also want to thank my family because they had to put up with me as well, preparing for debates like this, but also preparing for research material that I had to do. Um, but going back to something about family, and I kind of alluded to this before within my discussion, that Islam puts community rights over individual rights, for the most part, and put God's rights above all of that. That is the prioritization of Islam. It's a different, completely different prioritization to human rights. We don't disregard or deny some of those 30 articles of the human rights. In fact, agree with a lot of them. If not, I would say most of them, frankly. I mean, it might come as a surprise, but we would just disagree with the way in which they're phrased and prioritized. We would disagree in the way in which rights are put over responsibilities. The Islamic discourse, it, it puts more emphasis on responsibilities than rights. Because if everyone is selfish, nothing will get done at the end of the day. If everyone's thinking about what they owed, then there will not be reciprocity in a communal space. And so therefore, membership or fraternity to a community is prioritized over individual interests, and that is something we say comes from divine command theory, but also helps for the welfare of human beings across time. Actually, this is something which many liberal scholars, I would call them liberal, maybe they wouldn't call themselves liberal, would actually ag agree with me on, they're referred to as communitarians, like Michael Sandel in his book, Theories of Justice. They actually say the community spirit, you're, you're born into membership and family and so on and historical lineage, and therefore you should uh, prioritize communal arrangements before and above uh, individual ones, or it is the case. Now, going back to one thing that we did disagree upon, which was definitions in this uh, debate, I think that my opponent did employ a fallacy of equivocation. For example, if someone in front of me now had a heart attack, maybe one of the liberals, when he saw my first presentations, I'm only joking, had a stroke, and then maybe the doctor, I say, is there a doctor? The doctor over there comes, and actually, Dr. Goulet comes up and tries to, I said, I want a doctor, but in this case, I meant a medical doctor, not a professor, right? So it's using a word in a completely different way in order to avoid a particular argument. So when I was using the word liberalized, as I've proven in popular usage, this means in reference to political philosophy, in particular liberalism. But he, dis he disengaged from that because he knew the moment we scrutinize liberal philosophy is the moment that would be the end of the uh, debate. However, to end this debate on a good note, what I would say is that instead of reform, we should both, and we, I think we do agree, that there should be reconciliation between Muslims, traditionalist Muslims, and liberals. And both of us need to be as flexible as possible in facilitating such reconciliation. As the Quran says, Lakum dinukum you have your way and we have our way, but we will build bridges and we thank you for all the good work you do. So everyone, a round of applause for Ralash Gulen. It has been a great honor for me today to host, to host this great debate between uh, Muhammad Hijab and Lash Gula. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this efforts of ours and put barakah in this and make us and give us more opportunities to arrange debates like this again. Say Ameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of us to the right path. Dr. Lash, Muhammad Hijab, and all of us, we all need the guidance of Allah. Say Ameen. So with that, I thank our two participants, uh, Dr. Lash and Muhammad Hijab, and I will conclude this session by this. And for those who are watching online 
and all of you as well, as I mentioned early, earlier or in the beginning of the program, that we are working on a project to establish a masjid and a da'wah center here in the heart of Norway, in Oslo, in the capital of Norway. So please go into the website saveiman.com to read more about this project, saveiman.com, and you will find the link in the description of this video. And please participate with your participation as much as you can. Thank you so much. Brother Fahad, how's Iman doing? Not good, Akhi. It's not good. <laughs> is it really that bad? I'm really afraid it is. Is there anything we could do to save Iman? Yes. Iman is dying. But we can save Iman with your donation. Please watch until the end and give for the sake of Allah. And He subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you up to 700 times in return and build for you a house in Jannah. I am Fahad Qureshi and I'm chairman of the Islamic network, IslamNet, one of the most influential Islamic organizations in my nation. I was born and raised in a European country called Norway. In search of a better life, my parents migrated to Norway in the 70s. What they didn't realize was that Iman may not be able to survive this journey. The population of Norway is around 5.3 million people, with Muslims making up 200,000 of that population. The number of Muslim names is increasing, but the number of Muslims with Iman is decreasing. In other words, Iman is dying in the hearts of our youth today. Islamnet has been for the last 10 years working non-stop and developing key da'wah projects to maintain the Muslim identity for our next generation. So we are making a change. I was a non-Muslim with no purpose in life, but Allah guided me and Islamnet gave me a platform to spread Islam in my country. Islamnet has given me an opportunity not only to learn Islam, but also to give da'wah and invite other children to Islam. I can't express how grateful I am for having Islamnet in my life. Through our projects, we are combating Islamophobia, inviting non-Muslims to Islam, giving tarbiyah to the youth, guiding non-practicing Muslims back to Allah, giving support to reverts, fighting extremism, and empowering the Muslim community to get involved in da'wah. We have been operating from a small office that no longer can cater for our needs. We need to establish a masjid with a da'wah and community center that can host Islamic events and exhibitions, have a youth center and offices where we can have full-time du'at, expanding the da'wah and tarbiyah programs so we can bring up a generation of youth aspiring to make the word of Allah the highest. Fahad, that is absolutely brilliant. We have to do this. Brothers and sisters, donate generously and help us to establish this masjid and da'wah center. And don't forget to make dua and share this video on all your social media platforms so everyone can benefit from this amazing project. We are not going to let Iman die. We are not going to let Iman die.